I'm ready. I, I thought they were going to tell me when to go. So um, thank you guys so much for coming. I realize Monday morning this is probably the last thing you want to hear about. You think it's probably not going to be very interesting, but I promise you it is my goal to make this um, an interesting presentation and also something that you can take back um, to your profession. So who in here is an instructor, just so I get an idea? Oh, lots of instructors. Do I have any owners, school owners? A couple school owners. If you didn't raise your hand, what are you? Are you anything? Oh, her assistant. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure who I'm talking to. It helps me to sort of gauge what I'm saying. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier that sometimes um, if you're an instructor, one of the things I love about teaching instructors is that you can only pass on what you learned, right? Like if you didn't have great instruction in the science part, it's hard for you to like grow it and make it exciting. And so one of the things that I've tried to do um, in developing the education that I teach is to make it exciting and make it interesting and so that you can take it back to your students and maybe say it in a different way and they can actually hear you rather than feeling like you're just telling them to go home and memorize a book because it's content maybe you're not comfortable with because maybe you didn't get the best education in that area. So um, feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, we will have questions and answers at the end. If you ask a question, I'm just going to repeat it so that the people um, that are watching it on the webinar can actually hear what you're saying um, since you guys don't all have mics out there. Um, any questions before we get started? All right. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. Let's see if I can make this work right. Or not make that work right. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm good. I'm good. So a little bit about who I am. Um, my name is Leslie Rosti. I am not um, a cosmetologist. I'm not anything to do with cosmetology, as you can tell by my really lovely hairstyle. Oh, by the way, you guys taking pictures? If anybody wants this entire presentation, I will email the entire thing to you. The very last slide on here is my email address. I'll send the whole thing to you. So don't, you, don't waste all your memory taking pictures of stuff. I mean, you can if you want. I don't, totally don't care. But it's not necessary, all right? Um, so I'm not a cosmetologist. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in nursing, and I have my master's degree in microbiology. Um, as a nurse, I worked on the ER in labor and delivery. And when I was getting my master's degree, I worked as an infection control nurse um, in the hospital. I did that for about 15 years. Um, I live in Kansas City, so that's where I did all of that. Um, and then about nine years ago, I came to work for King Research. I tell you that really just as a matter of disclosure of who I work for, but not because I'm going to try to sell you on any products. What I'm trying to sell you on is why you do the right thing. Why do you practice infection control? Why do you teach it correctly? Why is it important besides the fact that there's a whole lot of rules that tell you that you have to do it? Um, so my background, I talk a lot about what I've seen out in the real world. I talk about what um, I've seen in the ER. And that helps students to sort of attach to what they're trying to learn as we do it. Um, the class that we're teaching, that I'm teaching today, is technically we call it barbicide certification. Has anyone ever had me come to their school? Have I ever done it in any of your schools? OK, so occasionally somebody will send me an email and say, hey, will you come to my school? And if I'm in the area, I might call you up and go, hey, I'm going to be in Santa Barbara. Can I come and teach at your school on Wednesday, whatever? Um, a barbicide certification class um, takes about two hours because I go over the state, the rules of the state. Um, everybody gets a certificate with their name printed on it. And they get a little bag of like goodies. So some of this stuff is up here. One of the things students like are these little lapel pins um, that say that they're barbicide certified. Everything's free of charge. We don't charge anything to anyone who uses me as a service. So that information is available to you as well as my business card if you want it um, at the end of this. I have the luxury of having a job where I just get to go out and educate. I don't have to sell anything. Um, I'm just selling you on, like I said, the reason why you would do this. Some of the other things I do, just to be clear with you guys, and we might want to turn down some of these lights as we get into the gross pictures, by the way, because then they'll look a little bit grosser. Um, but for right now, this is fine. Um, some of the other things I do, I write for Milady, so um, probably quite a few of you use Milady as your textbook. If you have that textbook in particular, and you turn to where you see the authors, I can't remember what page, like maybe page 54, you'll see that ugly picture of me that was on the slide before. That ugly picture will be in there, because I write all their science content. So I write. Um, chapter 5, I write skin structures and disorders. I write anatomy and physiology. I will tell you, I'm not a huge fan of how we teach science um, in cosmetology and barbering. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it because I think we waste a lot of time and gray matter teaching things that don't really matter. Um, I don't think it makes you a safer cosmetologist to know the names of all the bones in the body. That doesn't help you be safer in your job, which is what the state licenses you on is if you are safe at what you do. I don't think that learning what a bacteria looks like under a microscope makes you a better cosmetologist or barber because nobody has a microscope in their salon or barber shop, right? So it doesn't really help you do your job. 
So I'm trying to evolve that education. So someday you may see a textbook and you're going to say, hey, she, she got it changed. I'm working on trying to evolve that education so that we don't spend a lot of time on rote memorization that doesn't really help people, but that we spend more time doing things like talking about chemical safety. How do I read a label? How do I store chemicals safely? How do I dispose of them safely? How do I work safely when I'm pregnant? I don't care if you know how electricity is made. I really could care less. But I care if you know how to use it safely when it comes to an outlet. And those kinds of things, those applied sciences, I'm trying to push to get more into the textbooks. For right now, it is what it is. The board exams cover what they cover. Um, but they both know if I have my way, that will change. <laughs> um, I also help all the states, virtually all the states, um, writing their rules regarding infection control. Um, working with their state boards. I sit on um, two different commissions here in California. In fact, I was just here about a month ago, maybe, um, sitting on one of your, your health and safety commission. I sit on that commission. Um, I've done a couple other things with your state, but helping to write the infection control rules so that they start to make sense, the rules make sense. Now, I had nothing to do with your last set of infection control rules. I know there was a lot of um, angst about some of them, but as you probably know, some of the ones that were the most problematic have already been changed or re revised to make a little bit more sense. So I just want you to know those other things I do just in case that ever makes sense to you, that you want to call me up and go, email me, call me and say, hey, I have a question about this thing. So I start every presentation with a little bit of science that I try to make pretty simple. Um, there is a section that has really gross pictures, so if you're somebody who is going to like get sick, throw up, pass out, cry, something like that, I'll tell you when we get to that section, and then you're on your own, because things don't gross me out like they might gross you out. Um, so if you're that person, maybe you want to watch it like that when we get to that section. But I start every presentation with this slide, whether you have been in cosmetology or barbering school one day, whether you've been licensed for 30 years, this slide makes a difference to you today. And you're looking at it and you're going, duh, I know all that. Thing is, what you might not notice is that in, when we talk about infection control, that big umbrella of how do I prevent infection from being spread from client to client or from a client to me so that I take it home to my family, when you're looking at that big picture, really the terms we should always be using and only be using are the three you see up here. Clean, disinfect, and sterilize, all right? Now, there is a word that is missing that you guys all expect me to be saying, and I'm not saying it, and it's not on the slide. What is that word? Sanitize, right? Sanitize or sanitation. That word shouldn't be on this slide, because guess what? It's not in your textbook. It hasn't been in the textbook that you use. If you use Milady, it hasn't been there since the girl with the red hair and the braid down the side. You know which one I'm talking about, right? It hasn't been there for a very long time. If you go back and you look at that textbook at the beginning of chapter five, there's an editor's note, and it says, the editors of this textbook have elected to remove the word sanitize in its entirety from this textbook. If I come and help the state of California write rules, I'm taking the word sanitize and sanitation completely out because it has no business in your rules, and it really shouldn't be in your language anymore or the language of your students, and here's why. There's three steps or three parts. Cleaning is the first step always, right? And that is removing surface or visible debris. Cleaned it, right? That's it. I cleaned it. If I vacuum, I'm cleaning. It's typically a mechanical process. Vacuuming, hand washing, all those things are cleaning processes. It takes what is just kind of hanging around and gets rid of it. But the next step is to disinfect. And that is intended to kill things. So you're going to use a chemical, which I know is kind of like a four-letter word to a lot of people, but sorry, bugs are pretty smart and strong these days. So you're going to use a chemical that is intended to kill things. In this case, in a salon, in a barbershop, a spa, whatever you're working, you are required to kill bacteria, viruses, and fungi, all right? All three of them. Which of the three of those is the hardest to kill? Which is the one you're least likely to find on a label somewhere? Fungus, all right? Fungus is the hardest to kill. If you've ever had a fungal infection, you know that, right? But the reason that the word sanitize isn't here is because if it was on this list, it would go somewhere between clean and disinfect. Because the definition of sanitize is effective against some bacteria. That's it. No viruses, no fungi. Things that probably make us the sickest and are the hardest to treat aren't even on there. It's why we hold you to the higher standard, not of sanitizing, but of disinfecting. All right, disinfecting kills all three of those. That is the role of that. On non-porous surfaces, all right? Glass, metal, and plastic. Can't say that enough. 
You cannot disinfect your hands. You can't disinfect your body because your body is porous. You cannot disinfect a towel. You can't disinfect a sheet. They're all porous items. You can get them really, really clean, but they can't be disinfected. The only things that can be disinfected are glass, metal, and plastic, typically. There are some other materials out there, but hard, non-porous surfaces is what we're talking about, all right? It's why some certain things are single-use items. It's why um, a nail file is a single-use item. It's why a pumice stone is a single-use item, right? Because those items cannot be disinfected because they're porous, all right, for the most part. There are some that are made differently. Sterilization isn't required much in the um, cosmetology world, but I want you to know what it is not, and that's why I bring it up here. Sterilization kills all microbial life. Anything you put in is dead, right? Anything that's living dies when you sterilize it. And sterilization is typically done in an autoclave, and an autoclave uses heat and pressure. And those two things combined kill everything that in, in there. It is not a box with a blue light coming out of it. I don't care what it says. It might say sterilizer 5000, whoop de doo It isn't sterilizing anything, because let me just tell you, there is no truth in advertising. I could go to Google today and type in salon sterilizer, and I'll get like 500 pages of things I can buy. They're about 500 bucks, 300 bucks. It looks like a toaster oven, has a blue light coming out of it. And guess what? Consumers walk in, hey, I want this service, and out you pull your implements out of the little blue light that says sterilizer. You might even think you're sterilizing. UV light is not approved for sterilization anywhere in the United States except large volumes of water. So if we all got in a bus and drove out to the water treatment plant, there'll be a big blue light going through that water. Awesome. That's cool. It is not okay in your place of business. It is not, it's not sterilizing. It's not even disinfecting. All right? So that is what it is not, that blue light. Right? An autoclave, if you've ever used one, an autoclave is a box. Usually they're about this big. Um, they're solid plastic or metal. Um, they take a very long time, the process from beginning to end, so they're not very cost effective because you put a few items in and it takes a very long time for it to heat up that hot and then to cool down. So a lot of people when they buy them find out that it isn't very cost effective because you can't turn it over very quickly. All right? If you decide to use an autoclave, the one thing I would beg of you to do, because an autoclave that is not functional becomes an incubator. Right? It gets just hot enough to cook things and make more grow. Bacteria likes warm places, so you need to have it tested every 30 days by an independent lab, right? They'll send you a little packet of spores, you stick them in there, and you send them back and they say, yes, they're dead, so you know that it actually is working. That all make sense? Any questions about this slide, about why you're not using the word sanitize? All right. If I had that little men in black pen and I could like erase all your minds and you wouldn't say it anymore, that'd be great. Because you know where your students learn it? It's from you. Because every once in a while I'll be talking and I'll say patient because I can't get that word out of my head. It's hard for me to not say patient, just like it's hard for you to not say sanitation. All right. That's, it's just I realize how hard it is to unlearn something you've said for so long. Okay. When we do disinfect, we're going to do two steps always. We're going to clean the item first because if you've been, if you come in to get a haircut and I'm cutting your hair, which would be a really bad idea. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Um, I have oils on my hands, right, from whatever I've been doing. So I have oils on my hands. That's getting all over the handles. So if you had, um, you know, product on your hair, if you have oils, whatever, it gets all over the shears or the comb or whatever I'm using. And if I take that item and I stick it directly into my disinfectant, the chemical can't make contact with that surface, right? Because there's all those oils and products and everything in the way, which is why you clean an item first. It's written in your rules. You should be teaching your students that. Um, soap and water, um, and then they always have to be rinsed. Okay, if you use soap and water, anything that bubbles, um, that surfactant, what makes those bubbles, is going to um, make the uh, disinfectant fail to work effectively, so you need to rinse it before you put them in there, all right? Um, some people use chemical cleaners, like, um, like we make ship shape, right? That's one of the chemical, chemical cleaners people use before it goes into a disinfectant. But when you do pick your disinfectant, in your state, and in every state, it has to be EPA approved or EPA, um, it has an EPA registration on it, all right? Now, I'd like to say that we make that really easy for you. Like, it should say on it, how do you know this is EPA registered? It should say, EPA registered is like in big red light, so all you have to do is go look for that label, right? And it doesn't say that because the EPA dictates every single thing on this label, what size the font is, what order the content goes in. I mean, it is a very long process to get a label approved by the EPA. So the only way you know if your product is EPA registered is somewhere back here by the barcode. It'll have an EPA registration number and an EPA establishment code. And those two things let you know that the EPA said, 
everything on this label is true. We, they proved it, and we approved this label because it was proved that it was true. So you want to use an EPA registered disinfectant, and you want that EPA label on all your containers or something similar to that. In your state, if it's not required, you want something similar to that. And the reason you do is, let's say you take this plastic bottle, and it doesn't say anything on it. It's just clear. And you mix up some barbicide, and you write barbicide on it with a Sharpie. I know it's barbicide. You know it's barbicide. But if your customer's five-year-old thinks it's Kool-Aid and drinks it, what's the next thing you're doing? Calling poison control, calling 911, sending them to the emergency room. And that is not enough information for them to help that child, right? They need to know who manufactures it, what are the ingredients, what does it say about first aid on that label. So when you're mixing something and putting it into a secondary container, you need to make sure that that information is available. Most manufacturers, like for us, if you go to our website and you find barbicide, on the product, it'll say print an SDS, and then it will say print a label. And you can print all the labels you want and stick it on whatever container you're putting it in so that that information is available. One of the rules of your state, um, not a lot of states have this rule. When we get to rules, I'll have already said it, so this is great. Um, but one of the rules of your state is you always have to have a manufacturer's label available. So if you use the end of your container to make up, let's say, your disinfectant for the day, you can't throw that container away until you have a new container there. So you always have to have the label available, even if the container is empty, all right? You're always going to mix disinfectant according to your label and directions. And I say that because you guys are really creative people. And somehow you figure out how to measure hair color all the time. But this is how most people measure disinfectant. Mm, that looks like the right color. It's a very visual thing for you guys, for, for, for most people who are out in the working world. I'm guessing because you're instructors, you're probably pretty meticulous about it because you want your students to be meticulous about it. And I'm telling you what, if you mix it that way, you're always wasting money. Always wasting money. Because if you don't make it concentrated enough, it's not going to work. So why bother? Save the money and go buy a Starbucks, right? If you over-concentrate it, it can only do what it can do. It cannot do any more. You pour it, put it straight into concentrate or you put it straight into properly diluted, it's going to do the same thing. It can't do any more. More is not better, all right? So get used to measuring it because I think when you get used to measuring it, you're going to find that the consistency helps you to feel comfortable about um, the concentration and you want the students to go out and do the same thing, all right? Um, so make sure that you're measuring it. And, by the way, every disinfectant has a different mixing ratio. Some is one ounce and a gallon. Some is two ounces and 32 ounces. So you need to only do the math one time for the container you're using. That's all it really takes. And teach the students to do the right thing. Um, you're going to change it at the manufacturer's recommended intervals. How frequently do you change your tub, jar, whatever of disinfectant? Um, when it's cloudy, visibly dirty or... Okay. The federal label on every single EPA registered disinfectant and your state says every day. You change your disinfectant daily. It says it on every label, whether you are buying our product, Marvicide, bleach, they all say change daily. And your state says it. Your state used to say whenever it gets cloudy, I think it was once a week or if it gets cloudy before, it is daily. And that is on the federal label, the EPA label that says you have to change it every single day. The reason for that is when they put that label and they approve it and they say, yes, it kills all these things, what they're saying is we know it kills all these things when it's this exact concentration, but we don't know what it's going to be like in two days or three days or four days, so it has to be every day because then we know it, it will work, right? If we're going to give you the proof, we're going to say, yes, for a fact it works, we want to make sure it's going to work, so it is changed every single day. The only difference for that would be, I didn't mix any of this up, I should have, but let's say this was a bottle of barbicide. How frequently would you have to change this? You can use this until it's gone, right? Because you're not sticking anything in it and contaminating it, and it's not open to air, all right? So if you use it in a, a bottle like this, then you wouldn't have to change it. But if you're using it in a tub, a jar, anything you're putting things in, you have to change it every day. And then the last there, I, my kids say this is screaming at you. I'm all, all caps here, contact time. I could be writing the nicest thing and my kids would be like, why are you yelling at me? And I am yelling at you because this might be the one thing that you, I can get you to remember from this class that is so important as you go forward. And that is none of this stuff is magic. None of it's magic, all right? Contact time is the amount of time that an item has to be in contact with that chemical for it to kill all the things on the label. If you take a pair of shears, and you even take, let's say, raw bleach, 
and you stick them in and do this, you might have killed a few things, but you didn't kill the things that are going to be in my gross pictures. My gross pictures are way down in the time range, all right? When we put a contact time on something, the contact time for barbicide liquid is 10 minutes, all right? If you're going to immerse it, it's 10 minutes, all right? So we'll start with that. How do we get that 10 minutes? How do we come up with it? Well, I'm going to take a process that takes about a year, and I'm going to make it like five seconds here, all right? We go to Washington, D.C., to the EPA. Okay, we go to a lab somewhere, and we send it to them. But we put out all these Petri dishes, bad things, all right? Bacteria, virus, fungi, bacteria, virus, fungi, just a whole bunch of bad things, right? Barbicide, 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 barbicide. And everyone starts watching their watches. Dead, 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 dead. And when the very last thing is dead, hmm, 10 minutes, all right? That's how you get contact time. All the things written on this label that it kills, it doesn't kill them all right away. Some of them take eight, nine, or 10 minutes. The things that are scare, gonna scare you the most are always towards the end of that contact time. So contact time is important, all right? It's so important because you're wasting your money, again, if you're not gonna do it correctly. If you're just gonna dip things in, then you're wasting your money, all right? Because you're just killing the things that are really easy to kill if you're just gonna do it that way. Does that make sense? Now, contact time is kind of an interesting thing. I told you our liquid contact time was 10 minutes, right? Anybody use something like this? I call this Agent Orange because I think it looks like something that would be in my grandfather's garage and it's in the orange label, so I call it Agent Orange. But this has a contact time. If you read the label, the contact time on this is 10 minutes, all right? So we start seeing that we see a lot of things down in that 10 minute range um, because at 10 minutes we can kill a whole lot of things and not damage your implements. Once we get down into like the five minute range, you start seeing things on the label that the first warning says things like corrosive, all right? When you see the word corrosive, you should be thinking at home and at work. Ruins everything over time. Doesn't matter what it is, over time it's telling you, I will ruin everything I come into contact with, right? So the further we get down that contact time scale, because you can find things that have really short contact times, but they're going to ruin your implements faster. So that's a choice you make every single day. It's a choice your students are going to make every single day. What's more important to me? My expensive implements are, you know, a few minutes between every client. And everybody makes a different choice there. The one difference in all of that is that when we manufacture things differently, we sometimes can bring the contact time way, way down. And this is a good example. When you manufacture a wipe, because of how the chemical is manufactured, you can always bring the contact time way down in a wipe. So the contact time on something like this is two minutes, all right? And we're still not saying corrosive on the label, but it's a two minute contact time. And it's just because of how they're manufactured differently. So when it's an opportunity for you to use a wipe, that might be a good alternative because it will save you a lot of time. All right, so we're gonna talk about what's on a label and then we're gonna get to your rules and then we're gonna get to gross pictures. How about that? Because what's on a label is actually really important, especially when we start talking about chemicals. Because you know what? I'm guessing if you think about the student population you guys all have, they're all really young, right? And most of the girls are in childbearing years. And we're exposing them to a lot of chemicals. They're exposed to a lot of chemicals in their everyday life. And now they're going into a career field where there's a lot of chemicals. So I want you to understand what's on a label. When we come to talking about disinfectants, when we're talking about disinfectants, there's a few things that are always on a label. One is an efficacy claim. What do I kill, right? It tells you a whole list of things it kills, right? It will tell you, how do I use it? Well, I'm guessing everyone thinks they know how to use this item, right? It's a wipe. How hard can it be? So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Then it says where can it be used, all right? On an EPA registered, and also even not, any kind of a disinfectant, I'll say for use in the bathroom, for use in the kitchen, or on this one it might say for use in a doctor's office or a clinic or the veterinary, um, a veterinary care office, or it might say a salon or a tanning salon, whatever those words are that they let us use, it's going to tell you where you can use it. And then it's going to tell you cautions on first aids. It's going to say what to do if somebody drinks it, if you have to wear, I don't know, a radioactive suit to achieve it. It's going to tell you all the safety precautions that you need for that product. So I believe if you, we're going to play a little game here. I believe if you do something in your personal life, if you have a habit, you take that habit with you everywhere you go, right? If you wash your hands, let's say, every time you go to the bathroom, you just always do that. That's your habit, right? And so if you make it a habit in other parts of your life where it really seems more important to you, you'll make it a habit everywhere you go. So we're going to play a game. It's going to seem like we're kind of going off topic for a second, but I think it will help put this in your heads. It certainly helps when I have students in the room. They go, oh, I get it. All right, so who in this room cooked dinner last night? Anybody cook dinner last night? 
are you serious? Out of this whole room. All right, what did you cook? Jambalaya. He made jambalaya. What goes in jambalaya? Oh, he's laughing. It's like everything in the kitchen sink kind of thing? Prawns and sausage. Okay, it sounds delicious and really oh, spicy, right? Very much. Very spicy. Okay, who else cooked? What'd you make? Steak on the grill. Steak on the grill. Anybody else? What'd you make? Cinnamon rolls. Cinnamon rolls? Not for dinner, but. Oh, okay, you made cinnamon rolls. I was like, that's good. And did you cook, did you say? Broccoli over rice. Broccoli over rice. Okay. So we only have, and everybody else just amuse me and pretend like you every once in a while cook in your kitchen. All right. Okay, so who did you cook for last night? Self. Yourself, and who did you cook for? Your husband? My daughter. Your daughter? Your husband. Okay. So let's assume that when you're cooking in your own home, that you're cooking for people that you love, right? You might not like them every day, mm -hmm. but you love them. And by the way, that's pretty aggressive for cooking for yourself, jambalaya. I'm pretty impressed by that, cooking for yourself, jambalaya. Anyway, I, I, I'm not that aggressive with myself when I'm cooking, so that's, that's impressive. Like there you go. You love your kitchen. All right. So here's the thing. If I'm cooking and I'm making a meal for somebody, and like I said, if you don't cook, pretend go with me here, um, and you're using chicken, what are you afraid you might get people sick with? Salmonella. Salmonella. If you're cooking and you're using um, raw hamburger, what are you afraid you might get somebody sick with? E. Coli. e. coli. Here's the one people struggle with. What if you're using a lot of fresh vegetables? E. coli, e. coli right? Think about what happened to Chipotle, right? Why did Chipotle close for a whole day? Because they had people sick from E. coli from their vegetables. You guys live in California. I'm sure you drive by every once in a while and you see those beautiful farms out there. You see all those people out there picking it, whatever it is, and they're putting it in a truck. It's really warm here. It's really warm and moist in that truck. Lots of people touch it. So now we see how E. coli gets spread, on, particularly on vegetables, because vegetables grow on the ground. Most fruits grow in a tree. So that's the differentiating fact between fruits and vegetables. All right, doesn't really matter. All right, so let's pretend that you've made a meal. All of you that don't cook, pretend with me. And pretend that you've made a meal, and now you're going to clean up the area where you prepped your food, your sausage, um, meat, whatever it was, you're going to clean up that area. We're all going to go to that area where we all, everybody, I think, keeps their stuff is under the kitchen sink. And you're going to open that up, and you're going to pull out a product. And what you think what that product is, you're going to clean your kitchen counter with, all right? Some of you are going to pull out something that looks like this. Not this brand, necessarily, but just a spray that you bought. Who pulled out a spray? I got two takers for a spray. All right. Who pulled out something that looks like this? A wipe. I got a few. We're getting down to the nitty gritty. Who pulled out something that looks like this? I got a few takers. Do the rest of you not clean your kitchen counters? What the heck? <laughs> soap and water. Anything else? Soap and water. Anything else? I'm missing. What is it? Okay, so you use like a four nine, like a spray. All right. So we're going to talk about these products because I'm going to help you relate it to what you do at work and how you teach that to somebody else, all right? So think about your own home. So I just went to Walmart this morning, and I bought this. And this says it's 409 multi-surface. Ooh, ooh, it says cleaner. I just told you, cleaners don't kill anything. Disinfectants kill things, cleaners do not. So this could be a bit of a problem. Except for right here, in big, huge letters, it says, kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses. Woohoo! this is the product for me. I'm definitely buying this product, but, as you said, but, what's this little thing, oh, sorry, right here by the S. See, it's so tiny. It's an asterisk, right? A little tiny asterisk you can barely see. What does an asterisk mean? Yeah, there's a little more to, this might not all be true, right? Because if this really killed 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses, none of us would ever be sick because they'd all be dead, right? Because this would work. But there's really no truth in advertising. I already told you that. In America, corporate America has figured out, we only have to tell you something on the front of the label. We don't have to tell you anything else because you don't read the back of a label ever. And I would like that to change today. I'll tell you a funny story, and this helps you remember this. My sister came to my house. My sister's seven years younger than me, so I've bossed her around her entire life. And she came to my house at Easter, and she opened my refrigerator door, and she did this. And she said, we use fat-free half and half at our house. And I said, fat-free half and half? She said, yeah. And I said, what's in it? She goes, I don't know, but it's better for you. I said, <laughs> okay. Now, what's in half and half? What are the two ingredients in half and half? Milk and cream. That's it. And I said to my sister, so you mean to tell me there's a cow out there somewhere that we have programmed to give out fat-free cream and milk? I don't think so. 
So the next time I went to the grocery store, first thing I did, what do you think I did? I went to the dairy section and I pulled out the fat free half and half. And I turned it over and I read the label. What is the number one ingredient in fat free half and half? The number one, that means most by volume in that container. What's the number one ingredient? I would love it if it was water. But the number one ingredient is high fructose corn syrup. The ingredient that everyone tells us is going to put us in an early grave, give us diabetes, give us heart disease, to which I took a picture of it, sent it to my sister and said, you'd be better off eating a dozen donuts than drinking that cup of coffee, right? Because we don't read labels. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you is reading this label is important. Because if you just believe this kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses, it's a lie. It's just not true. But that little asterisk lets them t say, oh, you have to go read the back. Now, you want to read the back of this? This is the smallest font I've ever seen in my life. This is like two font. I would need like two pairs of reading glasses to read it, but I have read it a few times, so I know what it says, all right? I know that this product only kills one bacteria and two viruses. That's it. How it gets this on it, I don't know. It kills salmonella, but it does not kill E. coli. So if this is what you're using in your kitchen, make all the chicken you want in the world and use it correctly. But if you're making hamburger, for example, this isn't your product. It's not the right thing. You could just dump it on there and it's not going to work. This is a case of reading a label is really important. Nothing wrong with this product. It's just that everybody counts on you not actually reading the label, all right? Anybody up here have really, oh, you got glasses on. I'm gonna pick on you. All right, to disinfect. Do you mind trying to read it for me with your glasses? Do you see where it says to disinfect? Uh, spray until thoroughly wet. Spray until thoroughly wet. Uh, let's stand 10 minutes. All right, stop right there. Let's stand 10 minutes. <gasps> Guess what? Contact time. Let's stand 10 minutes. How do we all clean our kitchen counters? And wipe and go, right? So all we just do is spread it all around. Let's spread some salmonella over here and over here. This has a contact time, and it only kills three things, all right? Important to understand how these things work, all right? Let's look at another product. Who used this? Who bought this? No pick, I'm not picking up brand names, by the way, but okay, you pick this. Why do we buy these? Why do we buy wipes? There's a reason we buy them. They're really quick, they're efficient, they're, I mean, it's just like an easy, easy thing. And we think they're kind of economical because this one has 35 wipes in it, so I get 35 uses. I kind of know how much I'm gonna get. Now, this one also says kills 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria, and it doesn't have the asterisk, but it's got all these other weird signs like crosses and like dollar signs. So I think they've, they're on to us that we know what an asterisk means that maybe we won't figure out that these other things mean something else. And it says it kills colds and flu viruses. It kills some, all right? So let's say this is a, probably a better product. It probably kills a wider range of things. Notice there's no fungus still on here. So it still isn't acceptable for use um, in a salon environment, spa, barbershop, <laughs> beauty shop, whatever. Did I say beauty shop? I'm really old. Okay. Um, but here's where people fall apart on this product. How do I use this? Do you mind reading for me one more time? I won't, I won't make you keep reading. This one's easier. It's way, it's way bigger. All right. Um, to disinfect, right there. <clears throat> to disinfect, use, use to disinfect hard, non-poor surfaces. Uh, wipe surfaces to be disinfected. Use enough wipes to be treated surface to remain visibly wet for four minutes. Stop right there. Thank you so much. Use enough wipes for surface, surface to stay visibly wet for four full minutes. How long does the surface stay wet if you just wipe it and walk away? Depends. Depends how dry. In Phoenix, not very long, right? Okay. Depends how dry your environment is, right? And four full minutes to kill everything on this label? The way you're going to use this now is like this. All right, time for another one because that one's getting dry. That's how you're going to use this if it is a surface you're going to cook off of, right? Or you're going to have food that you serve to people type of a thing. Might not be the right product for you. Not a bad product. I own this product. You know where I own it? I own it in my car because I don't eat off the surfaces of my car, but I do like to kind of keep it clean. I'm at the stoplight. I'm kind of cleaning things up, right? I'm that person. So. This might not be the right product if that's not how you're going to use it. The importance of reading a label cannot be understated because this is important, right? All right, and now the big guns. All right, so I've got the big guns here and I'm using Clorox only because I've read their label a million times, but this would apply to all bleach. Now, 
because your state says you have to use a product that is bactericidal, virucidal, and fungicidal, bleach would be okay. They don't prohibit it anywhere, so bleach would be okay. So I really want to talk about it because I want to talk about it both in your home and at work. Bleach has a lot of... Um, We've taken bleach, um, if you're like me, I woke up every Saturday morning of my entire childhood at 8.30 in the morning to that smell and the vacuum cleaner. My mom wasn't going to let me waste a day, right? You're not, you're not staying in bed on a Saturday. You're going to get up and get things done. That was how my life was. So we became very complacent to some certain products. A five-year-old could go buy this today. And the number one warning on here, in the largest font on the back of this label, is the word corrosive. I told you, it will ruin everything it comes into contact with. It tells you right here. But we don't read these labels, right? We don't read it, and so we take it home, and we use it sort of in a lackadaisical way. We don't really pay attention to what this label says, all right? Now, the contact, let's agree, it kills all the things we want it to kill. And this... Uh, the contact time for this is only five minutes. So I told you, when we get to five minutes, we start getting to be a more corrosive product. There's some things I want you to understand about bleach that are really, really important, all right? You never, ever, ever, ever use bleach undiluted under any circumstances. You always dilute the bleach, all right? It's usually a 10 to 1 ratio or a 9 to 1 ratio, depending on what kind of bleach you're using, but you're always going to dilute it. I taught one time, and an instructor came up to me after the class, and she said, um, her husband had left the bleach on the wash machine, and you know how your wash machine sometimes goes like this and wiggles all over the room, and the bleach had fallen off, and the bleach had spilled all over the floor. And in her hurry to get it cleaned up, she just went in there and started cleaning, and she woke up in the emergency room. She didn't dilute it. She woke up in the emergency room. She was blind for four days, and she still, years later, talked like she had like a, a frog in her throat, so to speak, because it had burned her trachea. The fumes had burned her trachea. So it isn't something to play with. You always are going to dilute it. But you never mix bleach with anything but water. Anything. Nothing but water. If you mix this bleach with household vinegar, you create a gas that can kill you in less than 10 minutes. All right? If you mix this bleach with an ammonia product, you can create a gas that can kill you almost immediately, given whatever the circumstances are. The most common thing that we see that people mix together that is an ammonia product, when I worked in the ER, it was almost always women, uh, you know, maybe men aren't cleaning enough, I don't really know. It was almost always women that they would bring in in respiratory failure, and they'd been cleaning. And what they were cleaning with, they would mix bleach in with Comet, all right? Unless you're a chemist, when you read that Comet label, you don't know that it's an ammonia product. So they would have bleach, and they would be scrubbing their toilet bowl, and a lot of times they were in those... Um, bathrooms where it's like a closet, like off a master bathroom, you know, that's, you know, private, it's like a little closet, not very good airflow, and they would get it, go into respiratory failure. If they'd pass out, somebody would call 911, and they'd show up in our ER, and we'd be like, don't ever mix your bleach with anything, right? Nothing ever mix it, right? When you use bleach to disinfect, always mix it with cold water, not hot. Hot water causes bleach to separate. So if your kids are sick at home, and you're throwing all your sheets in the wash machine, and turning it on hot, and pouring in a bunch of bleach, you're just ruining your sheets. <laughs> you are not killing anything, all right? Cold water and bleach to disinfect, hot water and bleach to take a stain out, all right? Does that make sense? Yes? Good? We're good? All right. Now, I told you, okay, let's talk about what's popular in bleach. If you're buying bleach, if you're buying Clorox bleach, the one I can almost never find is Lemon Fresh. You know why? Because that is their most popular seller. It's Lemon Fresh, then something like Linen something or other, then this one, which is Fresh Meadow, then this guy, which is I call the pool boy, and then Splashless. That's the order they go in in terms of what you guys all want to buy out there. All right? So I told you the contact time is five minutes for, for um, Clorox bleach. What do you think the contact time is for this one? This is Fresh Meadow. Should be the same, right? Because they sit right next to each other on the shelf. There's no differentiation on the shelf. And this just says Fresh Meadow bleach, right? Can I get you to read one more time? All right, because you've got a good, loud voice, and I want everyone who's not in this room to hear this, all right? I would like you to read this sentence right here in the blue. Read it really loud. Not for sanitation or disinfection. To sanitize and disinfect, use Clorox regular bleach. All right, this doesn't disinfect. This is not a disinfecting bleach, all right? The only Clorox bleach that disinfects, and it's true of all the lines, is this one. We call it the pool boy. It smells like straight-up chlorine. This is what disinfects. This does not. This is chlorine bleach. This is oxygen bleach. Once we put a scent in it, once we make it splashless, once we change it in any way, it is no longer a disinfecting bleach. All right? So if you're trying to kill things, 
this isn't going to cut it, all right? Now, the way you can tell in an easy sort of manner is right here. So do you see instructions for disinfecting right here down at the bottom? It says for yes. disinfecting. Do you see instructions for disinfecting on this one? For clean and deodorizing, no. No, all right? That's how you know whether you have the right kind of bleach, all right? If you're going to be using it in your place of business, it better be this one because this one will get you in trouble because it's not doing its job. It's not killing anything. It's just for cleaning and deodorizing. It makes things smell better, right? Awesome. Your grandmother might have called this whitener, right? Because if I wash my sheets with this every single week, they're going to turn yellow and get holes in them. But if I use this, it's just going to keep them white. So grandma might have called this whitener, and that might be how she knew the difference between the two. The other thing about bleach is bleach has an expiration date. How long is bleach good for? It's good for six months from the date of manufacture. Not the date you open it, not the date you buy it, the date it was made, all right? And that's why I tell you, don't go to Sam's Club and buy a whole vat of it if you're not going to use it, right? Because you're likely not going to get it used in the six month time frame from when it was made. But how do I know when this bleach was made? They don't make it easy. It should just say it, right? Your milk says it, like Best Buy, you know, using it by this date or that date or whatever. All right, I'm going to see if someone over here can read this for me. Okay, see this little strip of numbers on here? We call it a lot code. If something's recalled, we all go look for this lot code. Oh, she got her glasses on. She's good. All right, in that strip, see if you see the number 18. Right here, in this strip right here. Do you see the number 18? Yeah. Okay, what are the three digits after it, the three numbers? 2401. Oh, 240, okay. Mm -hmm. So 240. This bottle was made on the 240th day of 2018. That's what it's telling you. Now, the 240th day is probably sometime in, somewhere in August, so this isn't very old, all right? It could be that you have a plant somewhere around here, so it's not coming very far, or it could be that Walmart had a big sale and <laughs> they're restocking, all right? But I was, not too long ago, somewhere, and I said to the person, look for the 18 on here, and she said, I don't see one. And I said, well, look for the 17. She said, I don't see one. I had bought it that day and it had been manufactured in June of 2016, all right? It had already been expired almost two years at that point, all right? Bleach separates. It's why we keep it in opaque containers. And once it separates, it can't disinfect anymore. So you don't want to expose it to heat or to light because both of those things um, speed that process up. But that six-month date is a really hard date. You do not want to go beyond that if you're using it for disinfection. It'll still smell that way. It'll still smell like bleach. It'll smell like bleach. You can go home and open a container you've had for five years. It'll smell like bleach. But it will no longer be effective for disinfecting. All right? All right. Any questions about any of that, about what you do at home? I, yes? Uh, cap full of bleach in your dishwasher. In your dishwasher or okay, so his question was about a cap full of bleach in your dishwasher or your dish, dish water. I'm not a fan, but it, at the same point, if it's something that you're, like, you really like doing, I can't make a case against it. Um, but I'm not a fan because what we know about the human body is that we know that what causes some cells to become cancerous, if you have a predisposed genetic code to developing certain types of cancer, all that has to happen is certain, you come into contact with certain things and it turns the switch, so to speak, genetically on you. And these types of chemicals are the types of chemicals that are known to do it. So I would not stick my hand in bleach water ever. That just wouldn't be something I would ever do. Um, if you put it in your dishwasher, I'm guessing you're going to be buying a new dishwasher way sooner than I will be because I don't, I don't even own bleach in my house. I don't own it at all. If somebody's sick in my house, everything gets washed still and cold because your wash machine doesn't really get hot enough to kill anything. The process, your hot water heater, if it was set hot enough to kill things, it would scald you so easily. So your hot wash machine doesn't really get that hot to kill things. It's that twisting and the bubbles and everything that gets dirt off. But what does kill things is that dryer. If someone's sick in my house, that dryer is running until I almost can't stick my hand in it. It's that hot because it's that dry, hot air that really can kill things. So, you know, I wouldn't do it, but it's not going to, it's not, it's not, it's not, a, I can't make a case against it other than the health factor for you personally. All right. All right. Any questions? Any other questions? Yes. Uh -huh. But all of our hand sanitizer says pretty much kills 99.9. .9. So what are we killing when we're doing hand sanitizer? You are jumping ahead, but I can talk about it. I No, no, no. No, no, I'm happy to talk about it. We can talk about hand washing now. I was going to talk about it in your rules. But in the state of um, California, you are required to hand wash prior to every service or to use an equally effective hand sanitizer. All right? Now, 
If you've ever heard me speak before, you know that I have been ranting and raving. Has anyone in here heard me speak before? Okay. So I rant and rave all over this country about, for years, how much I hate, and we're gonna, I'm going to get to you, so I'm going to have to go in this whole circle, antibacterial soap. Hate it, hate it, hate it. I literally was, would scream from the rooftops how much I hated antibacterial soap for years and years and years and years and years. And in September of 2016, guess who agreed with me? The FDA. And they banned the top 13 chemicals used in antibacterial soap. And I was like, woohoo! I was so excited. Now, there's two reasons I hate antibacterial soap. One is, is that our bodies are covered with um, that good bacteria. Typically, it's staph, staph aureus, garden variety, covers almost our entire external part of our body, covers almost your entire GI tract. And that bacteria is good because it takes up all the space. There's no room for bad things to grow because all you think about a parking lot, all the spots are taken, right? There's no place for the bad things to park, right? But if I go in and I wash my hands with antibacterial soap and it works, hmm, what's it going to be working on? It's working on my good bacteria. So now if I go and I shake your hand and you've been exposed to something, now I have spots for it to live. I have spots for those bad things to live. And that's called selection. That means we're allowing for bad things that were way worse than the good stuff that was supposed to be there, right? Why would anyone buy antibacterial soap? You know what? Because we believe the front of the label. Every mother in America went, antibacterial soap, my kids will never be sick again, and bought it in droves, right? We believed something that somebody told us that was only halfway the truth. The other reason I was really against antibacterial soap and the main reason it got banned is that the number one product used in antibacterial soap, the number one chemical, is called triclosan. And triclosan, we know for a fact, causes improper binding of estrogen in women. And it accumulates in your body over time. So if a little girl at two years old starts washing her hands with antibacterial soap, and she washes her hands her whole life, and now she's 30, and she's been having improper binding of estrogen her whole life, she may run into some infertility problems, and she may also get some female cancers later in life. So they banned all those products. Now. Yay for that. But the bad part is that in America, if a product is banned through the process of what we call call-in, which is how that got banned, so what happens is the, in this case, the FDA said, all of you antibacterial soap makers, you have to go reprove all of your claims. You've got to prove it works, and you've got to give us all the health information you have today. And guess what? They knew they weren't going to make it. They knew they weren't going to get approved. So they went out and filled warehouses all over the world full of antibacterial soap because if you don't make call-in in America, you're still allowed to sell every single thing that you have in stock, all right, until it's out of stock. So I could still go to Walmart today and probably buy some antibacterial soap with that chemical still in it, even though it was banned over two years ago now, all right? So you'll still see it, but eventually it will go to the wayside and we'll all realize that the good thing about hand washing in general, it's so simple. It doesn't matter what's in that container. The reason hand washing works is because of this. It's this mechanical process. It's making bubbles with anything, whether it's Dawn dishwashing detergent or it's soap, doesn't matter. Because those bubbles start pulling things off your hands and wash them down the sink. It's not anything that's in there. It's just the fact that there's bubbles. It's why we give children soap that's already foaming because they're not patient enough to make the foam, right? They're not that patient. And so we give them already foaming soap, all right? Now, hand sanitizer, to your point, is your op one of your options in this state. And it is not the same as antibacterial soap. I'm actually okay with hand sanitizer. I'm okay with hand sanitizer because while it's not as good in my mind as hand washing, it's also better than nothing. And I realize that in the industry, these people, your students are going into, time is a huge factor, right? They may not have legitimately the time to go wash their hands between every client, even if they want to. I got in trouble because I was speaking for one of our national customers. I'd gotten to all these trainings and I made the statement, I would never shake my customers' hands. I just wouldn't do it. Because you know what? I travel every week for work. I've already been on two planes this week. I'll be on two planes today. I'll be on two planes on Wednesday. I will sleep in a bed. I slept in the bed last night. I don't know who slept in it before me. I showered in a shower this morning. I don't know who showered before me. I'll do the same thing tomorrow. I'll do the same thing on Wednesday. I can't afford to go around and shake all your hands on top of it, right? I would get sick. Handshaking, if you're shaking hands with a whole lot of people, it's probably not a great prospect for you or all the people you're shaking hands with because you just don't have the time to do the hand hygiene you should. But hand sanitizer makes it more likely you will do it. What I don't like about hand sanitizer, and you're right, it's only 99%, but remember I said you can't disinfect your hands. You can only get them really, really clean. So it's as good as you're going to get without going to a sink, put it that way. Um, but what I don't like about hand sanitizer, as you all know, is it dries your skin out horribly. 
and then it leaves you more open to other infections. And every anytime you have an opening in your hand, no matter how small, um, that's the way a lot of um, bacteria, a lot of pathogens um, enter our body, is through those little tiny openings. Those little tiny openings you can't see, but when you put the hand sanitizer on them, you're like, ah, ah, ah. you can feel them all, right? Because you can't see them, but you can feel them. So that's okay. I, I can skip ahead. I, I can move around. I'm okay with that. So I was telling them earlier, it's kind of funny. We used to make hand sanitizer. We started making it again this year. We used to make it, and we made it um, scent-free and alcohol-free just for that reason. We didn't want to, you know, fry your hands out in the dead of winter so they were all dry. And I would be at a trade show or something. I'd say, hey, you want to try our hand sanitizer? It's scent-free and alcohol-free. And I'd spray it on someone's hand, and I'd go, does this even work? And I was like, I just told you there's no scent to it. People want it to smell this way, right? People want this to smell like chlorine. So it has a chlorine scent in it, even though it's not chlorine bleach, right? People associate, you know, there's even a commercial that says the smell of clean, right? Clorox is the smell of clean. Well, I can put the smell of Clorox in anything, and you'll believe that it's clean because I put that scent in it rather than it necessarily being so, all right? All right, we're going to talk about your rules, and then we're going to get to the gross stuff. I always start the rules section with um, this picture because I like this picture because an inspector sent it to me. I train inspectors in a lot of states, and an inspector sent this to me, and on this picture, there are five violations in most states, all right? There's at least four that are in every single state. So we'll pick out the four that would be a violation in every single state. Now, in the state that this picture was taken, that was about $600 in fines just in what you see on this picture, all right? So pick them out. What's the first one? The, what's wrong with the container? Not covered, number one. What's the second one? Okay, so the perm rods, it looks like they're on the floor. That's actually the countertop, but you're right. The perm rods are not in a clean or dirty. They're just laying out, right? So that's number two. What's number three? Yep. The barbicide jar behind is not all the way full. You see the handle sticking out. And number four, you might not be able to see because of the lighting in this room and how far away it is, but the barbicide in the jar behind is about the color of my pants, so clearly hasn't been changed every day. All right? Four citations right there. When you show something like that to your students and you say to them, that's 600 bucks. Think how many hours extra you have to stand behind the chair to pay that fine, right? And then you still have to pay your rent and your car payment and whatever else you have to pay. Not worth it. The number one, number two, and number three citations written all over the country are all infection control related, all right? The only other thing that's even close is licensure citations. If someone doesn't have their licensure isn't correct or whatever, you know, that type of thing, They're working with an expired license. But think about it. Most of the inspectors that I train the most common profession that becomes an inspector? A police officer, a retired police officer. And guess what? They just thought they're rule followers, right? And so if the rule says it has to have a cover, they don't care if you say, well, I just made this really pretty jar. It doesn't even have a cover. Too bad. Broke the rule, and you're getting excited. And look, you broke the rule. I can't really help you. So here's the rules in the state of California. Now, what I've done is taken your rules, and I try... California's not so bad, but in a lot of states... You have to go to about 18 different places to get all the rules in one place. It's over here, it's over there, it's over here. So I always try to pull it all together. Every single state, I have a one-page or two-page piece of paper that's in a Word document that is just bullet-pointed. Here's what you have to do when you do this thing. So people don't have to go read through all of the information that may or may not apply to what they're doing. So if you ever need those, email me, and I'll send you those as well. All right. So in general... Um, you have to have, at a minimum, a covered closed container for your hair. So the hair you're sweeping up, that is, not your hair, um, but for the hair that you're sweeping up. Um, a covered and closed container for your soiled linens and a cover and closed container for your clean linens. I, and I'll send you this PowerPoint if you want it. I'll send you the whole thing, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, you guys came in late. I told them I'll send you the whole thing. Don't have to waste space on your phone. Um, and a separate container for clean and dirty. That's at a minimum what you have to have um, in terms of those containers. You can't carry any implements in pockets or pouches. That means you can't put a comb, a clip, anything in a pouch, anything um, in the pocket of a smock, that type of thing that you're going to use on a client. That just can't happen. Um, no, none of those leather belts for makeup brushes or anything like that. Um, you have to use a neck strip when you are using a cape. And your neck and nail brushes have to be cleaned with soap and water and dried prior to each use. This freaks me out a little bit. Lots of states ban neck brushes because they can't be properly disinfected. Here is soap and water, um, and you let them dry and before you use them before each use. Now, if you're going to use a neck brush and you're going to wash it and let it dry before each use, you're going to have about 100 of them because it takes them forever to dry. Yes? I'm just curious, since you've kind of everywhere, I know California doesn't allow pockets or pouches, but do any states 
So no, there's only about 16 states that expressly prohibit them, right? So here's the thing. I will be in my job forever and a day. I'll be 90 years old and I'll still be out there trying to get states to come together on what these rules should look like, right? Because you should be able to move from California, let's say, to Ohio, and this should be the same, right? Because the bugs are the same. But the disparity is enormous. <laughs> you know, um, something that seems to be very common sense. I was just telling them, there's a state, I just talked to someone recently, and they've been citing people for not putting capes on people. Well, their rules don't say to wear a cape. Their rules say you have to use an extra when you use a cape, but it doesn't require you to use a cape, right? So it's just the rules are written in bits and pieces, and so sometimes the bits and pieces don't come together and make something that makes sense. But pouches and pockets and stuff, you know, and, and actually more states than not, it's just not addressed. It doesn't mean they like it. It's just not addressed in their rules. All right. Okay. Good question, though. Um, your disinfectant in the state of California has to be registered, EPA registered, has to be, we already said, bactericidal, virucidal, and fungicidal, um, mixed according to label directions. All of these we've already said. Manufacture label available at all times. That's what I said about even if you use the end of something, the container has to be there. Yes? Yes, you mentioned about the uh, uh, in Texas solution. Jen, is there, what happened? Look like my school, a lot of client pedicure, manicure, when it's cloudy, we jam. Sometimes we jam two, three times. So it ha okay. So her question was: it, Sometimes the disinfecting solution gets cloudy during the day, and that is absolutely true. And I, if I didn't wasn't clear there, I want to be clear. You have to change your solution daily, or if it gets dirty or cloudy sooner, you have to change it again. All right. But you you have to change it every day, and then if it gets contaminated during the day, yes, you do have to change it again. They they say to change it when it's cloudy. Yes. It, if you're reading a, a chapter I wrote, yeah. it says <laughs> you have to change it every day or when it becomes cloudy or contaminated, right? Because even if you just change it an hour ago and I'm an inspector and there's hair floating, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite you for it or make you change it. A good question. The, the, what I find out, the only reason it becomes cloudy is because they're not doing the proper cleaning of the tools right. when you put them in there. So her, what she's saying is that the reason it becomes cloudy is they're not cleaning it first and they're putting them in, and that's absolutely probably true, that they're just taking things and dumping them right into the disinfectant, and that's what's making it cloudy. That's probably the only thing that would make it get cloudy. So if they can practice up on washing things, cleaning them before they put them in, you won't have that problem, and you, you'll be saving money on replacing your disinfectant. Okay. All right. Right, but if they're cleaning them and getting all the hair out and stuff before they put them in, your disinfectant's going to last you longer throughout the day, right? If you're cleaning an item really well before you put it in, you shouldn't get any hair in there, right? So that's what you should be telling them. If I see hair in here, you didn't clean it well enough before you put it in, right? That's what you should be telling your students. Hello? Okay. Um, <laughs> your um, virucide or your disinfectant has to be sufficient height to cover all of the handles, everything, every piece, every part of that implement has to be covered. Um, your disinfectant has to remain covered at all times. We saw that on that picture. Um, you have to change it according to the manufacturer's instruction or when it becomes cloudy or contains debris, what we just talked about. And then your containers have to be marked as disinfectant solutions. So um, you'll notice you know, that most of the ones that are made, like ours says barbicide, and then it says disinfectant underneath it. All right? it it's denoted as being a disinfecting solution. Um, the procedure that you're going to use, all implements have to be disinfected prior to use. If they cannot be disinfected, if they're not glass, metal, or plastic, they are single-use items and they go in the trash, all right? Um, you can send home with somebody, let's say you're doing my nails and you have a buffing block and a nail file, you can send it home with me if I want to take it home and use it, but I cannot bring it back, all right? Nobody can bring anything in. If somebody brings something in and they want you to use it, um, some states expressly prohibit that, but if your state doesn't prohibit that, you are still required to disinfect that item before you use it, right? if it's disinfectable. If it's not, you can't use it. Um, anything that's not electric, you're going to wash with soap and water. We talked about that. That's the cleaning step. You're going to immerse it in the proper disinfectant for the time stated, so on the label, so the contact time. And notice they're saying immerse because underneath it, a couple lines down, it says with shears, you're allowed to use a spray or a wipe in place of immersion. immersion. Kind of a funny thing how that got in rules. People were like, disinfectant is ruining my shears. It's rusting my shears. Look, not the disinfectant that's rusting your shears. I take your shears and I stick them outside. I realize I'm in California where it never rains, but 
I stick them outside and it rains and rains and rains and rains. What's going to happen to your shears? They're going to rust. It's water that causes the oxidation on your shears, right? So if your shears are rusting because you're leaving them in disinfectant, it's because you're leaving them in there too long, right? It's 10 minutes. Take them out and dry them and you won't have that problem. But they give you the option to use a spray or a wipe. Um, and then you're going to store them in a covered container designated as clean. All right, you work out of a dirty container and into a clean, con out of a clean container into a dirty container all the time. All right, electric items. You're going to remove all the foreign matter. If we take clippers and we do this with a little brush and we get all the hair off in the trash can, for example, we're going to use a disinfectant that meets that requirement. So that's a spray or a wipe. Um, some of these that are aerosols will say on here cleans and disinfects. That aerosol effect counts as far as the EPA is concerned, for cleaning because it forces that hair out. Um, that's why it says it on there, so it's a one-step thing. Um, and then you're going to store them in a clean place. This was a huge issue if you use electric implements. If you use clippers in the state of California when the new rules first came out, it was all crazy about electrical implements, all right? Be clear that now they're saying an electrical implement, let's say your clippers, they can be stored in a clean place, but they don't need to be covered. So they can be on a clean towel, covered by a clean towel. They can be hanging on a hook. They can be you know, made for your clippers, that kind of thing. And they can be hanging on a stand, that type of thing. What I do not want you to do is keep sticking them in those bucket things on the side of your stations that you're not disinfecting because if anything's in that little buckety looking thing, a little thing down there, unless you're disinfecting that on a regular basis, all right? That's just a best practice, but you're not required to put them. I went to a place one time where, and when the first rule came out, an inspector had come and told them that they had to put their shears or their clippers in the clean drawer. They were using a drawer and then drill a hole for the cord to stick out because you can't disinfect the cord, which absolutely you cannot, right? So that, that's, it, that's not a rule anymore. So <laughs> let's just be clear that that got changed. Um, the prohibitions in the state of California, you can't use anything razor edged for the purpose of removing skin. That speaks to credo blades, rasps, um, egg graters. Um, I actually saw a picture that an inspector showed me one time of a cheese grater, a real cheese grater, like to grate your Parmesan cheese at home that somebody was using on someone's feet. And um, that's not, that not allowed. They got rid of this rule in one state recently. I have a funny story. They got rid of this rule. They, they got this rule recently in one state, and they were allowing it before. Now they have this rule, because there are some states that still don't prohibit credo blades. And this woman called. She was getting a pedicure. She was literally getting a pedicure and called the state board while she's getting a pedicure. She's really mad. Now, what this salon had done, and since they could use credo blades, they had gone and bought, bought, bought one of those mouse sanders, the electric one you plug in, the Black & Decker, like to sand in the corners and stuff, and they were sanding people's feet with a, cor with a you know, a corded sander. And she didn't care that the sandpaper was all white because it had been used on like 10 other people before her. What she was worried about was that she had one foot in water and one foot getting sanded and she was afraid she was going to get electrocuted. So people figure out how to work around these rules in very bizarre ways. Please don't do that. Don't ever use an electric sander on someone's foot. Um, but definitely you can't use a, I mean, we can't write rules for all the things people think of, right? There's not enough rules to make to think of all the things people would think of. Um, you can't have any needle-like tool used for extracting skin blemishes. Um, if they find one on the premises, you're going to get cited whether you're using it or not. And MMA, which is a nail monomer, which if you teach nails, you know that that's been prohibited for a long time. We're seeing it can make a big kind of a comeback lately um, in the United States. Um, but MMA is a monomer that um, not only is it a carcinogen, but it also is a monomer, if you've ever used it years ago, it's like concrete. And so it's dangerous because if my nail catches on something, rather than my nail tearing, it will rip my entire nail off the nail bed. So it's very dangerous. It lasts a long time, so people like it. Um, anything that, we already said this, that can't be disinfected um, has to go into the trash. Um, it's a single use item. And I underlined buffers and pumice stones. Those are the two most common ones we see reused over and over again. Um, and new supplies, if it's a single use item, it has to be um, stored in a clean covered place labeled new. All right, so if you're using all new, let's say, nail files, they have to be in that place labeled new, or they can be in individual wrappings, all right, so that they clearly are new. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, infectious disease, this isn't the whole rule. The rule's really lengthy, so if you're ever sick, you might want to go look on your website and look at your rules, but basically what they tell you, they give you a guideline for all these um, contagious diseases that you can't provide a service if you have them, and you can't provide a service on someone who has them. Now, as far as I know, anybody in this room go to medical school? They may go to nursing school besides me. Okay, I don't know how you're diagnosing everybody that sits in your chair, but apparently you're supposed to be because it says if they have these things, you can't provide a service on them. 
I don't know how you would know whether somebody actually has strep throat or just has a cold. Yes? Doesn't it say also common cold? Yeah, it, the list is really, really long, right? So, and the common cold is on there. And look, I don't want you guys diagnosing people. That's not really your job. Um, where I kind of draw the line on all of this is if somebody has, and I like how they have that, you know, you can't work on inflamed, broken, or erupted skin. Like they really give you a guideline to get somebody out of your chair if you don't want to work on them. But I want to remind students in particular, look, you are not required to provide a service on anybody. If you think that they are sick and they're going to, you know, get you sick, if you think something is contagious, you don't have to have a bona fide, oh my gosh, I know they have this thing. You can say no to any service for anybody, right? Like that's not... You're not being bound to do a service, all right? It is free industry, right? So you can say no. Your manager might not like it. Your owner might not like it. But if you think somebody really is a risk to you, you can say no. And to your point, the common cold's on there. The list is really lengthy. I mean, I would have taken up three slides putting it on there. But they give you a guideline for each of those things, all right? So you have a question? Some people, they sick. They have fever. They don't tell you how you know. That's what I'm saying. If someone's sick and they have a fever, how would you know? You wouldn't, right? So... My point is, you can only control what you do. You can't control what other people do. They'll bring your, their kids in to get their hair cut when their kids are too sick to go to school, right? And they'll sit their kid in your chair, and their kid will be like, <laughs> all over you. I don't get to talk to them. I only get to talk to you. So what I would encourage you to do is to give your students a voice, to give them the opportunity to figure out how they're going to say to somebody, I can't provide this service for you. Because it's very awkward and uncomfortable at the first. You know, when I was in nursing school, we had to practice how to tell somebody that a family member had died. Like we had to practice it. And we would like say it to like, like dummies and we would say it to our lab partners and we'd say it in the mirror. Because the time to learn how to say that is not when you're standing in front of someone who had a death in the family, right? That's really awkward. The words just don't come out. So one of the activities, if I were an instructor, is practice what you're going to say. What are the words you're going to use that are going to be, someone sits down and they, they feel feverish to you and they look sick. or they have some oozy, sore, pussy, sore, you don't want to work around. What are the words you're going to use? And everybody's words are going to be different, but I like that your state kind of gives you a license to say those things, to say, I'm sorry, I can't provide a service on you. Um, you have this open sore. I could lose my license, right? You'll have to come back when it's healed. And you might lose them as a customer. Well, okay, <laughs> whatever. I don't want you in my chair, all right? Liquids, creams, and cosmetics. This whole thing is basically to say that if I'm an inspector and I come into your place of business and I go pick up your pomade or your wax or whatever and I screw off that big lid, what am I likely to find in there? Hair, Hair but what else? Finger swipes. Finger swipes, right? Because that container is begging you. Stick your fingers in here. It's nice and big and open. At home, stick your fingers in it all day long. At work, your fingers don't belong in there. You cannot contaminate the rest of the container because... It's not being used on the same person over and over and over again. Um, if I'm an inspector, I can come in here and make you throw, at the very least, throw all of them away, all right? Um, I could cite you for every single one of them that has the finger marks through it, right? You're supposed to be using something that doesn't contaminate the rest of the container. So that is um, a wooden spatula or a, somebody asked me if they could use the end of a disinfected comb. I don't care as long as it's not contaminating it, right? If that's disinfected and you can get it out and use it, then um, you'll use that. And basically, I think that's all this says. Pencil cosmetics, if you're teaching cosmetics, I laugh at this rule a lot of times because it's in a lot of states. It says, pencil cosmetics shall be sharpened before each use. What is missing in that rule? The what? Before and after, but what's really missing? What if I have pink eye? Let's walk this through. What if I have pink eye and you put eye pencil on me? And then you put your eye pencil away and then you go and you sharpen it again. What is in that sharpener? All that wax from my eye, right? That sharpener needs to be disinfected too, all right? The sharpener needs to be disinfected after each use, and the pencil needs to be sharpened after each use, all right? So sometimes you have to think the rule through and say, well, that doesn't help. Especially, that's almost worse if the person before me had something, because now every woman who's ever sharpened an eye pencil knows there's a ton of wax down in there. Yeah? Does sharpening really do, is that effective enough? Well, if the sharpener is disinfected, the sharpener would take off that whole top layer that's going to touch that person. Now, could I make a case for the fact that if you had a really good case of pink eye conjunctivitis, that as you sharpen it, now you're just layering that whole sharpener with that? I could make a case for it, but it's the safest way to do it, all right? So if you're going to do eye pencil cosmetics and you're going to be using the same eye pencil, this is not good enough in my opinion. You have to, the rules should also say 
to disinfect the sharpener, all right, after each use, because that sharpener is just collecting all that disgusting viral bacterial stuff. Pedicure bowls, I could do, oh yes. No, no. Let's talk about alcohol for a second. She said, would it help to spray the pencil with alcohol? It'll ruin your pencil, by the way, because it will dry it all out. It will dry out all your makeup. And alcohol is um, banned in a lot of states for disinfecting. And the reason it's banned, twofold. One is um, alcohol at 70%, which is you really want, you don't want any higher than 70%. Alcohol requires water to be a catalyst, so you have to have some water in there. So 70% alcohol is what you want. But the contact time for alcohol is 20 to 30 minutes. So, number one, it evaporates in 20 to 30 minutes. It evaporates in about 20 seconds. Um, so you're not going to meet your contact time anyway. And the alcohol is highly flammable. So a lot of states don't want you having alcohol um, next to, you know, I don't know, drill bits and things like that where it, it could um, catch on fire. So that vapor can be, so I wouldn't use alcohol if it was me. I would just sharpen it and then I would disinfect the sharpener. All right. Pedicure bowls, yeah, you're welcome. Pedicure bowls. Um, I could write like 800 slides on pedicure rules in California. Somehow somebody got a little excited and wrote like 8,000 words on pedicure bowls. Yes, there are a lot of problems. That is where we see the majority of injury um, in this industry is in the pedicure world. Um, so suffice it to say, this is not all your pedicure rules. If you are using a certain type of bowl, you need to go and read about that type of bowl and how you're going to properly disinfect that specific type of bowl, but we would be here all day if I went over all those. So I kind of put it into a nutshell. And that said, in general, you are going to scrub your bowl with detergent and fill it with water and disinfect it. You're going to run or let it sit, depending if there's jets, you're going to run it. If it's just a, um, a bowl with no jets on or anything, you're just going to let it sit with that water in there. Um, for 10 minutes, you're going to drain it and dry it. That's at the end of each client. At the end of each day, you're going to take all the removable parts and you're going to disinfect all those parts. You're going to do that same thing, disinfect those parts. And after those parts have been disinfected and dried, you're going to put them back in. All right. And at the end of the week, you're going to do the end of the day procedure. Plus, you're going to let the disinfectant sit in there for six hours. You're going to let it sit in that bowl for six hours. I don't like this. <laughs> I'm not a fan of this. I'm a fan of the fact that your state went into great detail on all the different types of bowls. But what I don't like is the fact that if I come and see you on Saturday at 4 o'clock, I'm arguably getting the dirtiest service of the week. Monday at 9 a.m. is the cleanest service. Let's all agree, right? Because you're only doing that special thing once a week. Every single service should be equally safe. Every service should get the benefit. And by the way, it doesn't need six hours. I just told you it can only do what it can do. This can only do what it can do in five minutes. If you leave it for five hours, it doesn't do any more, except for eat your plumbing and eat your bowls. It can't do any more. So this six hours is kind of ridiculous, especially because that happens on Saturday if it happens. It happens on Saturday at 6 o'clock when you're done. Nobody's coming in in the middle of the night to take it out. It's sitting all night Saturday night and all day Sunday. So if it's this, it's just eating holes in your bowl. It's making a non-porous surface porous. It's eating the surface off of it. Does that make sense? So my whole point with these types of rules is be thorough, but be thorough for each client because you don't know who's sitting in that chair. Don't make me on Saturday get the dirtiest service of the week because if you think that's important, it should be done every single service. All right. So every service, in my opinion, removable parts should come off. I get a pedicure every about once a month this time of year. And I go to a place that doesn't have jets. I picked it specifically because of that. It has stainless steel bowls, and I feel like that is a much safer prospect for me. Those can be easily disinfected, all right? This is the place where people always ask me about tub liners. You know, tub liners are um, a thing. They're out there. It's also a thing that I've seen lots and lots of situations where tub liners are getting rinsed and hung up to dry. So people think they're getting a brand new tub liner, and they're getting a used tub liner, which is also not a good thing. So there's that. Um, linens. Immediately after you use a linen, you're going to place it in a covered receptacle only for linens. If I were to write this rule, what I would say is that receptacle has to have holes in it or some type of airflow through it. When you go to Walmart and you buy a laundry basket, it's got all kinds of holes in it. It's got holes in it so air can pass through. Because if I'm putting a towel in there at 9.15 in the morning and piling wet towel, wet towel, wet towel, wet towel, you might have a fungus, you might have a bacteria, you might have a fungus, you have a bacteria. There's mold, mildew, fungus, bacteria growing in there and that passing through of air slows that process down, all right? So if I were doing it, yes? What's the point of a stock container? 
the, what's the point of the top? The top, well, you want to have a top on it because number one, I would say, number one, I don't want towels, you know, going all over. And I also don't want any chance of dirty and clean getting, you know, I just don't want that issue. So, the, but what's more important to me are those sides, that there's some ventilation going through and we're getting air passing through it. It would be the opposite for your trash cans. I don't want you to have any holes in your trash cans because I want you to contain everything in those. Um, your laundering can be done commercially or it can be done, here's another rule, look, every state gets this from me because I come in and I'm like, I don't really like this rule, but this is your rule. If you are going to wash your own linens, they have to be washed at 160 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 25 minutes. Now, anybody know what the temperature is in your wash machine? Any idea? Anybody know how long it stays that temperature? Nope. So this is a rule I can't enforce because there's really no way to know what the temperature is and for how long, right? What they should just be saying here, they want you to wash it on hot. So wash it on hot. Let's turn it on hot. But this is really a difficult rule to enforce. Yes? The using of a bleach. That's what I was going to say. The temperature requirement makes the bleach. Well, I was just going to get there. But the use of bleach is a bad idea with that hot of a temperature, right? Because it, it makes the bleach much less effective, right? It's got a little bit of effect, but bleach really works with cold water, all right? So I, don't write, I didn't write these rules. I didn't write it, so I'm just telling you. But you've got to follow the rules, all right. Um, you have to store all your clean linens, towels, capes, everything in a closed, covered container, um, cabinet, whatever. It needs to be clean, closed, and covered. Um, brushes, they have a specific thing on here, and this is mostly talking about um, natural fiber brushes because a synthetic brush can be properly disinfected, all right? So a synthetic brush can go in whatever you're using and can be disinfected. But if you have a boar bristle wood-handled brush, you might have a problem because what is boar hair? Porous. And what is wood? Porous. Now, the wood is sealed when you first get it, but over time it loses its seal. Um, but the boar hair is always porous. I don't know the answer to that so because there isn't really a good one. Would I like you to try to disinfect it? Absolutely. But let's remember that, that it's, it is porous. So when you buy that item, you know that it's a porous item and it's difficult to disinfect. Um, they tell you to remove all the visible debris to use a cleaning agent such as, and they give you alcohol right here, use a cleaning agent. And they're calling it a cleaner, not a disinfectant. So they're saying, I'm going to clean it. I'm going to take that surface grime off. Um, you're going to dry it. And then you're going to store them in a container labeled clean. Look. I hate the brush question. It's the, my least favorite question. It gives me a rash whenever people ask me, particularly about makeup brushes, mostly because I like to give answers, and there's really not a good answer on that. There's no good answer if you are using natural bristle brushes. They're, they're not disinfected. They're not disinfectable. And most of the things, I know there's some companies that have come out with silicone type brushes. Most people who do makeup hate them. I, I don't know a good answer for you. Um, the best answer would be scraping makeup onto a palette, and then you can go back and forth to that palette as many times as you want, and then you know you disinfect everything. But if I have a perfectly disinfect, I have a brand new brush, and I go on to bronzer and I go onto your cheek, now where do I go? Can't go back here because I can't contaminate this whole surface, right? Because if she has some fungus that's growing on her skin that I can't see, if she has the type of bacteria that feeds um, on cystic acne, I don't want to pass that on to somebody else. But there is not a good answer. So you can ask me all day, and I'm going to tell you I don't have an answer. That's, my husband would tell you that's the one time in my life I say that. I don't know. I don't know the answer. So um, I'll work with the brush manufacturer someday. Maybe we'll figure it out. So um, these are the end things. Your headrest has to be covered with a clean towel or disposable, um, like the paper things for every use. Shampoo bowls have to be cleaned with soap or detergent. What they're saying here is the shampoo is not enough. Once you're done washing, you have to still clean it with shampoo, I mean with uh, soap or detergent. Um, this is the hand washing rule we already talked over. And then you use sterilization for electrolysis tools, and that is an autoclave. So steam or heat, not a box with a blue light. All right, so now we're going to go to the fun stuff. All right, so, and i got to get going on time. All right, um, do I have till 11? Is that what I have, till 11? Is that my time? Oh, just keep talking, okay. I'll just keep talking. I'll be here all day. Um, you guys are lucky. I have a flight to catch, so I won't talk all day. All right. So this is the section with gross pictures, all right? This is the section um, that will get your students' attention, all right? Number one reason we follow the rules, that's why it says reason number two. We follow the rules because we don't want to get a ticket, right? We don't want to get cited by an inspector. So that's a pretty clear-cut one. But these other ones aren't so clear-cut. So reason number two is there are things that should scare you. And I say should in italics. I move it to the side there because we spend a lot of time in cosmetology school talking about things like HIV and hepatitis. 
And if you stand in front of your students and you say, who in this room is afraid of getting HIV while they're doing their job as a cosmetologist? No one. And you know what? I agree with them. There's not a case anywhere in the world I can find that a cosmetologist, a barber, an esthetician, a nail technician actually contracted HIV while doing their job, right? I don't know what you guys do on your weekends. You might get it there, but you are not get it doing, getting it doing your job because HIV is very, very difficult to contract once it's outside the human body. If HIV is laying all over this surface, not only is it hard for me to get it and seroconvert to it, it also is real easy to kill on a surface. Horrible to kill on the human body, but super easy to kill on this surface. No problem, all right? So when you say it to students, not only do they not worry about it for that reason, but guess what? They're young. So if you're old enough, like my age, and you remember when HIV very first came on the news, like first came to the forefront, and what did everyone think? We thought people were just, it's like Ebola came to America. People were just going to be dying on street corners. That's what we thought, right? And when Magic Johnson announced he had HIV, we were all like, oh my God, here's like this pillar. He's just, I mean, he was our, what, um, LeBron, he was our LeBron James of the 80s, right? He was our LeBron James. He's just going to fall over dead. And about mm, a year ago, I was at a conference. Guess who the keynote speaker was? Magic Johnson. And man, he looks good. He looks healthier than most men his age. Been living with HIV for 25 years now, been HIV positive. And we wonder why kids aren't afraid of HIV? Because guess what? If I get HIV today, the CDC says, if I live in America and I get HIV today, and I follow my doctor's directions, instructions, I'll live a normal length of life. Right? I'll be taking some meds other people aren't taking, but my length of life will not be impaired. It doesn't scare them. This should, right? So I'm going to talk about some things that should scare them. All right? I always start this section with this picture. This actually is a video. I'm not going to show it because it's like five minutes long, and I like to talk, and so I don't like to give up my five minutes to this video, but this video is linked on our website. And this girl, can we turn any of these lights, just these front ones down so they can get the pictures better? I don't know if it'll help. Does that help you guys at all in the back? Okay. So this girl um, went for an eyebrow wax in Jacksonville, Florida in 2011. This was filmed in 2014. She looked like this at that time for three years from an eyebrow wax. She has an infection that is eating her face, and when she turns her head in the video, it's eating all the way down the back of her neck. She's all of 26 years old. She doesn't go anywhere except to, school, uh, except to work because people there know what happened to her. Um, she's embarrassed. People laugh at her when she goes out in public and stare at her. And she has an infection that requires, is going to require some plastic surgery, but they can't get the infection under control long enough to be able to do the plastic surgery, all right? So we're going to go through this little bit here, and we're going to figure out what she has and how she got it, because it's pretty clear cut how she got it. All right, so let's talk about a bacteria. So you go to the doctor. The doctor, you're sick, you either have a bacterial or a viral illness. Fungal things are sort of off to the side, but a bacterial or a viral illness. This is a bacteria, all right? Um, back, that bacteria, MRSA, people call it MRSA, they call it staph, which is kind of unfair, because garden variety staph is our friend. This version is not, all right? Anybody in this room know someone who's had a staph infection? A few hands. Anybody who's known someone who's died from it? I usually get a few people with that. All right. So if you know anything about it, you know that it is everywhere. We're starting to see more and more people. If I'd asked this audience six years ago, I might have gotten one hand. I probably got about 10 hands, all right? Everyone's kind of like this because nobody wants to tell their story. But that's okay, all right? But MRSA stands for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So that S and that A, Staphylococcus aureus, Garden variety, we like it. It covers our whole intestines. It's a good thing for us. This version of it, not so great. There's also a version called VRSA, which is vancomycin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So that's an even almost worse version of it. Um, vancomycin is the drug that if I, it's an antibiotic, that if I give it to you incorrectly in the hospital, even a tiny bit, I can make you permanently deaf in both ears. That's how strong the antibiotic is, right? And some of the antibiotics we used to treat this, we get to a patient and we say, look, we can give you an antibiotic, the antibiotic is so strong, it could kill you. So sometimes you send somebody home and they're dying from this because the antibiotics, they, they couldn't tolerate the antibiotics that might work for it, all right? So MRSA is really very common. And the truth is, if you are exposed to it and your body can't fight it, you are going to get sick, right? And it's an equal opportunity infector. I want you to hear me say that. It doesn't care anything about you. It doesn't care who you sleep with, what religion you practice, 
whether you eat vegan for every meal or you eat McDonald's for every meal or you smoke crack cocaine or you've never smoked a day in your life. If you live in a box, if you live in a mansion, it doesn't care. If you come into contact with it and it can get into your body, you're going to get sick with it. And it's very ubiquitous. We find it in all kinds of bizarro places. Um, we find it most commonly in places where people share things like implements or towels or things like that. That's where we see big spreads of it, but we can find it everywhere. And if I went around this room today, right this very second, and I scraped all of our skin, now you know my lady thinks you have a microscope in all of your salons and barbershops and everything. So we'd go to your little, we'd go to your microscope. Hmm, that's what this, oh look, there's some Staphylococcus aureus, yay. We all have it, right? Because I told you it's supposed to be there. But if I went around this room and I did a nasal swab on every single person in this room, a third of the people in this room, say that over, are colonized with this. It's living in your nasal colonies. It's perfectly kept in check by your immune system. It's not bothering you. It's not bothering anybody else. Your immune system will keep working on it, and eventually it will go away. If this room was full of floor nurses, nurses that work in a hospital, that number is 85%. 85% of floor nurses are colonized with this. It lives in their nasal colonies. That is a problem because they're dealing with very immune-suppressed people all day long, typically, because you've got to be really sick to be in a hospital, right? So keep in mind that that's a problem, but it's up there against intact skin, causing no problems. Keeping that in mind, that that bacteria that causes these things we're going to talk about here in a minute could live up in your nasal colonies, and a third of the people in this room. What was a really bad idea a cosmetologist had? A super bad idea. What, what thing do people do now? Nasal hair waxing. So I'm at a board meeting in the state of Washington, and I'm going over some stuff with their board, and it's a public meeting. It's a room like this, and I'm doing something like this. And some gentleman stands up. He's a barber, and he stands up, and he says, ma'am, what do you think about nasal hair waxing? Now, I cannot hide my emotions. I am not that person. I'm going to tell you exactly what I feel all the time, like I kind of can't not do that. And this is what I did. What? Nasal hair waxing? You do that? And then I turned to the board, and I said, you let them do that? And everybody kind of got a little weird and I got a little weird too but here's the thing cosmetologists come up with all these ideas doesn't mean they're good ones all right now if you are let's say you're colonized with MRSA and I go stick some hot wax up your nasal up in your nares right I stick some hot wax up there and I wait a few minutes it gets nice and hard and I yank it out let's all agree she no longer has intact skin right I just yanked a whole layer of the skin off when I did that I'm in an area where there's a really good blood supply. Think of a little kid with a bloody nose, right? <laughs> Lots of blood, right? And I'm about this far from your brain. Does it sound like a good idea now? Probably not, right? You don't like nasal hair? Figure out something else to do with it. This is not the thing. Don't teach people to do it, please. If I could ban it in every single state today, I would. But I don't get to, the process is very slow, especially in California, but the process is slow. But please don't teach people to do that. It's a bad idea. It's a dangerous idea, and I really don't want it done to anybody. So, All right, so these are the two types you're most commonly going to see um, in the environments that you work in. This top one we call flat patch MRSA. It's commonly seen, you see it here on somebody's face. You can see it up in their scalp. A lot of times those people that are pickers that pick at their scalp, they'll pick at a hair follicle, they'll get it all good and open, and then they'll touch something and they'll infect themselves. All right. So a lot of times that's where you use your rule. I can't provide a service when you have an open sore because you can't diagnose that. It could just be something else. It could be, you know, all kinds of different things, but it also could be this. And this is highly, highly, highly contagious. This one down here is what we call unifocal. Um, you can see that this person is getting two more spots, which actually makes it multifocal. But unifocal, the person will typically describe it to you. They'll say, I feel like I have a zit and it really, really hurts. It won't come to the surface. Like they want to go pick it and they're just like, it's so irritating to them because it's hot. It's typically got a um, big red area around it. Um, or they'll say, I think I have a spider bite. If you hear either of those two things in your own home or in your place of business, do not touch it. I know you all watch Dr. Pimple Popper. That's a big deal these days. Do not Dr. Pimple Popper this, and I will tell you why, and here's why. Because this on the right is going to happen all by itself in about 10 to 12 hours. You pick that, it's going to happen in about 4 to 6 hours. You have greatly reduced the amount of time that a doctor has to find the right antibiotic, all right? Because it takes a while to do what we call a culture and sensitivity, to figure out what bacteria you have, and what drugs it's sensitive to, all right? And so you want to give doctors as much time as possible. Don't touch it. Go see a doctor and, and get it fixed. 
Um, this picture on the left-hand side, you see that person's finger. That green pussy bacteria in, in the cuticle bed, that's kind of normal when you get a cuticle bed infection. That's what it normally looks like. What's not normal in this picture are those two red dots behind it. That's indicative of a MRSA infection. That person could very easily lose their finger. You know, when we talk about people that we cut limbs off of or they look like someone took a melon ball or two, it's likely someone who's had a MRSA infection. If we can't find the right antibiotics soon enough, we'll just start cutting things off because it's way, way easier to do that than for it to get systemic and it would kill you. Yes? So um, a lot of uh, barbers nowadays uh -huh. like to Not doing it. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, your body, here's what I'm always trying to say to people. Your body is really, really smart. Your body protects itself when it needs to. It, it does things on its own time frame, right? And so when you pop that, just like when you pop a blister, those kinds of things, you're leaving yourself open to a secondary infection. You are creating an opening where there didn't need to be one. Your body will do it on its own time frame, right? I, I'm, I usually get to this, but I'm going to say it right now. For example, let me just give you an example of how you need to trust your body to do the right thing. And I, I, I know an ingrown hair, it's painful, and it's, but do you doing it in your place of business for somebody else? Look, if they go home and they pick at it, that's their own thing. But you are creating a scenario where you're opening something up, and unless you are 100% sure that everything you have done has been bacteriologically speaking, pristine, every single thing has been disinfected properly, don't take that chance. Don't take that chance that you're going to be the one. Because I always say this to people, you might be the one to nip somebody. That's totally human nature. It's not human nature, but that's totally part of this job, right? You accidentally, you know, clip somebody, you know, cut somebody, cut yourself. But don't be the one to introduce a bacteria or a fungi or a virus. Don't be that person. So unless you're absolutely certain. But I'm guessing that none of you are sure enough that you'd be willing to open up tissue. So... I would just say, I was going to say, we talk about um, what happens if you do get a cut. If you do get a cut when you're working, the way to solve that is not to do this and keep working, right? The way to solve that is not to go to the nail technician and say, hey, give me some nail glue. I'm going to glue this shut. That is not the answer either. The answer is go to a sink. Milk that cut if it's on your hand. Get some blood running out of it because that blood will force anything that went in your tissue out and let the water run over it. And then you're going to, because you're at work, you're going to cover it with any, um, some type of dressing, uh, Band-Aid, whatever. But you don't want that dressing to stick, so you're going to put something like antibiotic ointment or triple antibiotic ointment, Neosporin, something on there, and then you're going to cover it. The one thing you're never, ever, ever going to put in a cut after today, because you're going to promise me you're never going to do it, not at home, not at work, nowhere, is hydrogen peroxide. It does not go in cuts. Grandma taught you it was a great idea, and you saw everything bubbling up, and you're like, yay, it's killing things, and it was cool. It is a great disinfectant. It kills a lot of things. But here's back to your point of how smart your body is. Your body is so smart, don't shortcut it trying to do the right thing. When I get a cut, before I even know I have a cut, my body knows. And my immune system is already sending cells to that area. And those cells have two jobs. One is to kill bacteria. Two is to start the process of granulation. That is sealing that over, creating a scab, or sealing it so the flap of the skin closes to prevent you from getting a secondary infection. Hydrogen peroxide kills those cells. It might kill bacteria, but it also kills those cells, and it leaves you open to secondary infection longer. The rule of thumb, if you get a cut, don't put anything in a cut you wouldn't put in your eye. If you wouldn't stick in your eye, don't put it on a cut. So alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, you could put triple antibiotic equipment in your eye, be fine, Neosporin in your eye, that would all be fine. So don't put anything in a cut you wouldn't put in your eye. Let your body do its job. Okay. For those of you that are queasy, this is probably the grossest picture I have. So this is a guy that works at our plant. And so I know this story really well because when it's happened, like 800 people sent me this from work. And I show you this because I want you to know how easily transmitted this is, right? This guy had a ring on this finger and he was doing this, trying to get the ring off. And when he finally pulled it off, this fingernail, as it sometimes does, pulled up a layer of his skin, like it's almost like a skin knee, all right? And the MRSA was living contentedly between the band of his ring and his finger. No problem. Intact skin. Back to the nose, right? Intact skin. Not a problem. The minute the skin was not intact, this is what happened, right? It decided to go live in his finger, right? This is how we heal it. It's sewed open because we want it to heal from the outside, from the uh, inside out. So it's healed like that, and it will just heal with scar tissue over that. It'll never look the same, and it won't be useful, but he has a finger. 
I think it's, I never noticed what finger it was either, but it's kind of funny. Okay, um, here's just some other depictions. This one up here on the top left does look like a spider bite to me. If you came into the ER and I was working there, I might think it was a spider bite. So you can see that there's all these different ways it would look. And this is my tattoo slide, not because I dislike tattoos, but because it demonstrates how much bacteria likes non-intact tissue. It's a great place for it to go have a feast. Look, it ate in like a floral pattern over there, and it ate in like whatever this thing is over here, this little flamey thing on the bottom. It's a perfect depiction of why you have to take good care of your skin when it is non-intact, all right? And that includes bruises. Bruises are considered non-intact tissue, so you need to make sure that those areas are protected or covered, especially when you're working with the general public, because you don't know what you might contract. Yes? What type, what brand? Okay, so let's be clear that, so th I'm glad you asked that question. Antiseptic and disinfectant, two different things. Alcohol is an antiseptic, so that's okay. If I'm, if I'm your nurse and I'm coming in, I'm going to start your IV, I pull out stuff out of my pocket and I take my alcohol wipe and I go like this. Not because I'm disinfecting it, it's an antiseptic, right? It's taking that top layer off, right? So when we say use an antiseptic in a blood spill procedure, we're not saying it's the same thing as a disinfectant, all right? So there is a difference in that, in that terminology. All right, let's get to viruses. So we talked about a bacteria, and now we're going to talk about a virus. And when you go to the doctor and you have a virus, what does the doctor say? It's just a virus. What does the doctor give you? Hopefully nothing. Just a virus? Anybody want to sign up for some of these? Just a virus? You want to sign up for a little HPV, some HIV, hepatitis? Those all sound delightful, right? And the doctor doesn't give you anything, hopefully, because what we're counting on when you get a viral infection is what? Your own immune system. That's why it's so important that you keep it healthy, that you do things that keep your immune system healthy. If I did the kind of job I do, and I didn't work to keep my immune system healthy, I'd be sick all the time, right? Because I travel all over the country. And I already told you, I have a really horrible travel schedule. But you know what? This morning at 5 o'clock, I got up and I went to the gym. Because you know what? I know that makes a difference for my health long term, right? I'm not saying everybody has to do it at 5 in the morning. My point is, but when you get a virus, I'd rather get a bacterial illness every day and twice on Sunday. Because I might be able to be treated with antibiotics. Where if I get a viral illness, I can't treat you. Because viruses live in your healthy tissue. If you get a viral infection in your lungs, you don't want to be killing your lung tissue, right? But if you look at this list, a lot of these can be prevented through vaccination. Whether you believe in vaccines or not, read the list and know that that's the way Mother Nature worked. Somehow we can treat a lot of bacterial illnesses and we can't really prevent them other than disinfection, but we can prevent viral illnesses through um, uh, vaccination. All right, we're going to talk about two um, viral illnesses that we hear a lot about in the news things that are really common, um, influenza. So influenza, this is the 2016-2017 season because we won't have the numbers from this last flu season probably for about another six to eight months. It takes a long time for them to tabulate the numbers. On average flu season, we lose 25 to 40,000 Americans to the flu, um, not always people that had any other thing wrong with them. Um, this year, I think the number's going to be closer to 70,000 when we get those numbers back. We lost a lot of people to the flu. It killed a lot of people this year. And if you watch the news, you know that that was true. If you watch the news, what was unique about this year in flu season? Who died from the flu this year? What type of person died from the flu this year that didn't used to die? Young, healthy people, right? A woman runs a marathon, she's 40 years old, and two weeks later she dies from the flu, right? 16-year-olds, 8-year-olds, 10-year-olds, young, healthy people dying from the flu this year. Who usually dies from the flu? Old people, right? And infants, right? So that's what we usually see. We usually see both ends of the spectrum. Want to know something interesting? You can say at a cocktail party if you're ever at a, that's like an old term, cocktail party, but let's pretend. If you're at a cocktail party, do you know why more people, young, healthy people died this year? Because the strain of flu that we saw come through, through North America this year was very similar to a strain that came through the United States in the 40s. So most people who are over you know, the age of 70 or so were already exposed to a, a similar version of the flu in their childhood. And so once you've learned it, once your body has been exposed to a virus, it learns and you don't get it again. That's why if you were my best friend in kindergarten and you're my best friend today, when you got sick, I got sick. You got sick, I got sick. You got sick, I got sick. But somewhere over in high school, you got sick and I didn't get sick. 
because I'd already been exposed to what you have. You got sick, I didn't get sick. It's why when you get into like your 40s, you don't get sick as much. It's not because being 40 is so like carefree and relaxing and pristine and you know, quiet. If you're 40, you know that's not the case. You don't get sick as much because you've been around a long time, right? You've been exposed to a lot of things. When you get into your 50s, you'll have something happen where you'll think you're getting sick. You'll, about 9 o'clock at night, you'll be like, yeah, I don't feel so good. I think I'm going to be sick. I'm going to wake up sick tomorrow. And you don't. Because you know what? You've been exposed to a lot of things. Your body can figure that out from a viral standpoint. So that is the sign your immune system is actually working, all right? So um, that's the case. Now, when we talk about influenza, we get a different strain every single year. And we're always guessing what strain is going to come. That's why some years the flu vaccine is great and some years not such a good match because it's always a guess. Most flu, most flu viruses we get come from Asia and we have to sort of wait for them to travel around the globe to sort of guess what we're going to get. So it really is a guess. Um, if you decide to get immunized, we usually tell people to get immunized mid-October um, to November. If you live in an area where there's a lot of um, international travel, they might have you um, get immunized sooner. Now, anybody in this room actually have the flu ever, like, went to the doctor and they said you had the flu? Because here's this thing. Lots of people say they have the flu, but very few people actually have the flu. You have really bad virus, but it's probably not the flu. So here's how you're going to know if you have the flu. I can give you two ways to know not to go to work, all right? Call in sick, don't come to work. Number one, if you are throwing up, you don't have the flu. The flu is a respiratory illness. Hear up, all right? does not include anything in your stomach area. The only people that throw up with the flu are small children, and they throw up because their fever gets so high, and that's what causes them to throw up, right? But adults typically don't throw up with the flu. I've been married for 30 years, and my husband says, I have the stomach flu. <clears throat> no, you do not. <laughs> you have a stomach virus, or you ate something bad, but you don't have the stomach flu. And if you ate something bad, it wasn't at my house, because I disinfected the counters. <laughs> the other way you know if you have the flu, and this is the one way uh, if anyone in this room was ever in the, uh, said they had had the flu, they would say, absolutely. And this is a pretty bona fide way to know if you have the flu. If you haven't been feeling good for a few days, like, oh, I don't feel good. Oh, today I really don't feel good. Mm. I'm calling it. I got the flu. You don't have the flu. But if you feel great and everything, all, all the cylinders are firing, everything's going great, and an hour from now you feel like a Mack truck ran you over, you have the flu. It is that fast. It is no gray area, black and white. I feel great, I feel horrible. And I even had a stylist tell me one time she started a color service on somebody, felt fine, got to the crown of her head, had to stop, have somebody else finish the service and call her husband to pick her up because she didn't think she could drive that fast. If that happens to you, do not go to work, don't go to your kid's school, don't go to the grocery store, don't go to Walmart, don't go to the library, go home. Because I just told you, 50,000 Americans every year die from this. You might not die, but you might give it to somebody who could die from it, all right? So if that happens to you, that really fast turnaround, you probably have the flu, call your doctor, but don't go out in public and spread it all around. All right, shingles. What did you have as a child to get shingles as an adult? Chicken pox, right? When you're a chicken, when you're a chicken, when you're a child, <laughs> it's varicella zoster. When you're an adult, it's herpes zoster, all right? It's just the same exact virus being reactivated in you. Um, now, if you never had the chicken pox, can you get shingles? No, all right? You have to have had it. Now, there are some people that get such a light case of the chicken pox, they don't know they had it, and we can always test you for it. We can do a serological test to determine whether you've had chicken pox in your lifetime. In fact, if you get pregnant, we're gonna do that on you. We're going to kind of, we could kind of create, when I was a labor and delivery nurse, we could kind of freak you out. We could come in your room and go, hey, when did you have Coxsackie virus? When did you have mono? And you're like, wait, how did you know that? Well, because your body keeps track of all those kinds of things, right? Your body creates an antibody to them and it keeps track. So we'd be able to know if you've had the chicken pox, but you have to have had the chicken pox to get it because it's a reactivation of that virus in you, right? These people aren't going to be coming in for visits probably. They're going to stay home because anybody in this room had it? It's quite painful, all right? We used to think of it as an old person's disease, um, we're seeing it now in elementary school children, all right? We're seeing it across all age ranges now. So if you see something that looks like this, it looks a little bit like um, poison ivy to me. It's got the little wheels. Um, the most common place we see it starting is right here around your waistline, more towards your back. Um, but it can be anywhere. It can go on your face, and it can make you permanently blind. So if you think you have it, it's worth going to the doctor um, to see if they can help you um, reduce um, the, the symptoms and the severity. 
There is an immunization available for that. Um, it's down to 50 now, so if you're 50 or older, you can get the immunization for shingles if you had the chicken pox. And I think most people who have had shingles would say, do it. You don't want to have shingles, but that's entirely up to you and your doctor. Um, this is just kind of fun. This is a pathogen survival rate. It tells you how long things live on surfaces, and I think that's just kind of interesting to look at, especially since we just said that, for example, that E. coli that that product doesn't kill, it can live for up to 16 months on the right surface. All right, so you think you wipe down that surface. Oh, you know, I, it's been two days since I've been there. I'm sure it's dead. Probably not. It can live for a really long time um, in the right environment. But when you look down this list, if you look at influenza, you see it only has a one to two day survival rate. That's why we have a short flu season. We don't see flu all year round typically because flu only lasts for one to two days and you can't infect as many people, right? And we see higher rates of influenza in areas where people are inside in the cold weather because we're all breathing on each other than places like California where people are outside um, most of the year. So we don't see flu season lasting as long. All right, this is a game I play with the students since I'm gonna play it with you. We call this service or refer. I'm going to show you a picture. I want you to tell me whether you want to provide a service on this person or if you want to refer them to the doctor before you let them sit in your chair. How about this person? Why are we referring it? Open sore. That's it. No diagnosis needed. You are not nurses. You're not doctors. You're not, in, you're not diagnosing. Open sore. Sorry, I can't see you. It doesn't matter whether it's contagious or not. Open sore. How about this person? Okay, so this is kind of a trick question, but if I'm in a state where someone's proposing a rule about a bill about deregulation, this is my favorite picture to show. Because sometimes people say, what's the worst that can happen? A bad haircut? And I'm like, oh no, there's worse things. So this is not an infectious disease. This is a chemical burn. This is why you teach your students to read a label, to use the right developer. If it says not to use it under heat, you don't use it under heat. Some cosmetologist is paying this lady's mortgage for the rest of her life, right? And you don't want it to be you. You see how her hair's all burned back there? So this is a chemical burn. This is what happens when you don't read labels or you read them and you ignore them. Refer. This is an interesting picture. This is two different things, but they look a lot alike. But you're going to refer both of them because you don't know which is which, and that's why I put them up there. The one on the left is a spider bite. The one on the right is MRSA, all right? So because they look very similar at different stages, you don't know which is which, so you're gonna, at the very least, get them out of your chair. Whether they go see a doctor or not, that's up to them, but you're gonna get them out of your chair, all right? How about this person? This is someone's abdomen, but it can be anywhere. I, I realize it's confusing to people, but that's, just to orient you, that's the person's belly button right there in the middle, so. Okay, what's your name? Jerry. Jerry. Jerry said it's psoriasis. Now, I'm going to pick on you for a second. Jerry, I'm sorry. I've been picking on you a lot. Um, Jerry, if this is psoriasis, do you want to provide a service? Well, I, got, I can refuse. So. You can refuse, but what? what psoriasis, I know it's a skin disorder, right? So, wow, that's a trick question. It's, it's a trick question. <laughs> it kind of is a trick question, and good of you to point that out. It, it kind of is a trick question. What do you guys know about psoriasis? What do you teach your students? Psoriasis is a genetic disorder. It is not contagious. You are way more risk to this patient, or this client, than they are to you. See, I did the patient thing. Um, because if you aren't using perfectly, perfectly pristinely disinfected implements, this person has poor skin integrity all the time. They never have good skin integrity, right? So you are a risk to them. They are zero risk to you. You're not getting this, right? But I told you, don't provide a service on an open sore. And those off, let those look pretty open, right? This is my single exception to that rule. Because some of these people, if they waited till all that was healed to get a haircut or a service, they'd never get one. Because some people have chronic psoriasis that they can never get right. But most of these people have a note in their wallet they've been carrying around forever that says, so-and-so has you know, psoriasis so that you know that it's a safe thing for you to do, right? And if you can put your arms around that situation, this might become your best client ever because they don't want to explain themselves 800 times. It's embarrassing, right? And they might come in and say, you know, I'm doing really great this, this week. Can you get it really high and tight because I don't know when I'll get to do that again? They might come in and say, you know what? I'm having a really bad week. Just trim it up enough that my boss, you know, won't fire me, whatever that is, right? And so put your arms around this situation. This poor person goes through enough um, just having psoriasis, 
I will tell you anecdotally, and I mean anecdotally because there's not a ton of research out there, but the three things that do help psoriasis patients, um, one is sunlight, so those are the people that are going to tanning beds in January. Um, second is pregnancy, so I'm sorry, gentlemen, that's not an option for you. And then the third one, and we do not understand the science of this, is hair color, the chemical and hair color. And so I had a stylist one time who had psoriasis, and she colored her own hair every two weeks because it kept um, it from skin. She said, no one's going to let me touch them with that on my head. So she would color her own hair. She said, I'll keep doing it until my hair falls out, is what she said to me. <laughs> All right, how about this person? Okay, so anybody want to vote weigh in on this? Refer? Who wants to refer? I got a couple. He's like his hands halfway up. <laughs> Did anybody want to refer and do a service? Yes. Is that what you want? Okay. All right. I want everyone to pay attention to this. I want you guys to all go home. And if you have a classroom, I want this to be part of every single class you ever turn out from here on out. This person, if you do not refer them, they will die. This person probably did die. This is malignant melanoma. All right. Now, what you did not tell your students when they got into school, which is really cool, is that they, over the course of their career, will likely save somebody's life. They're not firefighters, they're not policemen, they're not doctors. They will save someone's life. They'll probably save several people's lives over the course of their career if they do the right thing. The American Academy of Dermatologists awarded barbers and cosmetologists as an industry an award for being the number one industry to refer deadly cancers. Because here's the thing. I can't see the top of my head. I cannot see the sides of my head. I can't see behind my ear. I can't see the back of my head. I can't see it. You are the only people who see it. And you know that whole thing, I am my brother's keeper, it's our responsibility. You have to say something if you see something. You cannot be, I'm in too big of a hurry, I don't know what to say, I'm uncomfortable, because somebody could die. And it doesn't always look like that. I guarantee you that does not look the same on me as it looks like on him, as it looks like on him, as it looks like on her. It depends on how long you've had it, the color of your skin, the texture of your skin, what it looks like. So don't be diagnosing people. I don't want you doing that. But here's what I want you to teach your students to do. What's your name? Robert. Robert. So if I'm cutting Robert's hair and I notice anything, <laughs> I notice anything on Robert's head that doesn't look normal to me, it looks just even a little bit off, here's what I want to say to Robert. You know, Robert, you have something on the back of your head. I'm not sure what it is. Like, it could be a bug bite. It could be a birthmark. I don't really know what it is. But I want you to see what I'm seeing. Take that technology. We all carry around this 24 hours a day his or mine, take a picture of it. Robert, this is what's on the back of your head. Don't tell him what to do. Don't say, go to the doctor, don't go to the doctor. It's his decision now. The minute you show him that picture, you are done. He might not go to the doctor. He could go home and die from cancer tomorrow. He might go to the doctor and come in with a big fruit basket for you and say, thank you, you saved my life. Because remember, it is your responsibility because nobody else is probably looking there. I'll tell you, my husband plays golf every chance he gets. I don't go picking around on the back of his head and behind his ears. But the girl who cuts his hair, I've told her, you better tell me if you see anything. She cuts my hair too. You better tell her, him, me if you see anything on his head because I'm not going to go picking at his head, but I know you can see his scalp, all right? This is important. And this person, how about this? This looks like a garden variety rash, right? So here's the thing. This slide is meant to have you ask some questions, meant to get your students to ask some questions. You could ask me something simple. Hey, Leslie, I know you got that rash. Is that, I mean, I got my tank top on, of course, you know. I know you got that rash. Is it itch? Have you been to the doctor? And what I might say to you is, yeah, I went to the doctor and they put me on antibiotics and it told me not to go out into the sun and I went to the, the beach all weekend and now I look like this. All right. But what I might say to you is, yeah, you know, I haven't been feeling very good lately. I've been really, really tired. I've been kind of achy. I think I might be running a low-grade fever, and now I've got this stupid rash. Hmm, that's a way different thing, right? That is my body screaming, something is wrong in here. The largest organ in my body is screaming, help, something's wrong, all right? That first one, okay, I get that. You were dumb. You went out to the beach, and you got sun exposure when you shouldn't have. This one? Get out of my chair. This is not the chair you're supposed to be in. You should be in a doctor's chair. Because that picture could be, I went to the beach when I was on antibiotics. But it also could be what this picture is. And this is a picture of German measles, the most contagious disease on planet Earth, right? So ask questions. Make yourself feel better about the service you're about to provide. 
You can ask whatever you want. HIPAA does not apply to you. HIPAA applies to healthcare workers. So you can ask whatever you want. If somebody's willing to answer, all right. This is my last picture with this person. I'm going to provide a service to her if you're doing something on her face. What is this? Anybody know what this is? This is herpes. And how did she get it? And this is not a sex question. How did she get it? A dirty wax pot, right? Herpes will happily live on that rim of that wax pot, on that surface of that wax, as will HPV. And they will both live happily in your eyebrows, on your upper lip, from an upper lip wax and a dirty wax pot. All right, no double dipping ever. All right, I'm running over on time, so I'm gonna go quick on the rest of these. Um, reason number three, doesn't have to kill someone. In 2018, you don't have to kill someone to lose business, right? Robert, what's your favorite restaurant? Italian food, um, I like Olive Garden. Olive Garden, okay. So Robert goes to the Olive Garden on whatever street over here, let's pretend, all right? All of us are friends with Robert on Facebook. Robert seems like a nice person, so we're all friends with him on Facebook. Robert goes to the Olive Garden tonight after he's done here. About 2 in the morning, he posts on Facebook, don't ever go to the Olive Garden on whatever, whatever street, Trexel Road. I am laying on the floor in the bathroom. I'm going to lose like 15 pounds tonight. I don't know what I went in to put in the toilet, right? I'm going to lose some weight. Yeah, he's, 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 he's feeling good about that part, right? Now, are you going to Olive Garden tomorrow? No. Are you? Is anyone in this room who read that going to go to Olive Garden tomorrow? Right? He might not have gotten sick there. He might have gotten sick from something he ate somewhere else. It doesn't matter in 2018 how it really happened. It only matters he's giving you the idea that it could have happened from Olive Garden. Now, it might affect their business for a day or two, and then, you know, pretty soon you're going to go back to Olive Garden. Robert will probably even go back to Olive Garden, right? He'll forget about it and we'll all move on. But I want you to think about that bad news travels faster than good news in America in 2018. Nobody posts the good stuff on Facebook. We all post the kind of grossy, grossy stuff, right? And if that grossy, grossy stuff is about your salon or your business, it will hurt it. It is important what people are saying. Sometimes what they're saying isn't true, but you have to be on top of what people are saying about your business. Because what you need to remind your students is, this is a service industry. You count on me coming back every four weeks for my haircut or every two weeks for my nails. You count on me coming back. And if I don't come back, you have to figure out how to replace me with somebody else to fill that chair, to fill that spot, right? And so it is important what people think. And so you have to do the right thing. So sometimes when I'm bored in a hotel room, I do weird things. I go and look at Yelp. So I was looking at Yelp. I pulled out a few priceless little moments here. Someone took a picture. Now that picture on the top left is the drain off of a pedicure bowl. It's been t taken off and it's turned over. Now, if you request this PowerPoint from me and you look at it close up, you're going to see it's got all kinds of grody stuff in there. Clearly not disinfected in a very, very long time. This picture to the right is also a, a nail situation, but you'll see everything. All the containers are open. There's drill bits laying out. There's drawers open. It's filthy and disgusting. Let's read this review. This review is a five-star review. Yay, that's so great. I got a five-star review. <laughs> but let's read it. Best pedicure ever. Hot, hot water. Hot towels. Great massage. Even got out the razor. The razor is illegal in Iowa where this occurred, all right? So if I'm the inspector sitting outside and I just look up your Yelp review, guess what I'm looking for? I'm looking for that razor because I know you got it out, all right? If I see those pictures, I know something went awry. In the state of Nevada, they have an arrangement with um, Yelp, and Yelp, every 48 hours, sends them a report of every single salon, everybody that they license in the cosmetology and barbering board, they send, if anyone writes filthy, gross, disgusting, it's like 120 search words, it goes to the state board, and that is how the inspectors plan their routing every day, based on what consumers say. What about California? Um, California does not do that, but guess what? They might someday. How do you want, you want that haircut attributed to you, or this nice little eye doodad from, I think, I think it's a burn from eyebrow waxing, is my guess? Um, or how about this? Sucks. They have messed up lots on my son's hair. Cut him because they are not probably trained to use a straight razor. But who uses one of those on a three-year-old? Now, let's all agree nobody used a straight razor on a three-year-old. But the problem with this, that salon or barbershop never went back in and made some kind of a comment saying, you know what, it had to have been whatever, whatever. We don't use straight razors on anybody, especially not a three-year-old. They just let it be, all right? So it's just hanging out there for every consumer who pulls up and tries to make a decision, do I want to go here or go there? 
Look, if I pull up to a strip mall and there's a five-star restaurant, a two-star restaurant, I'm never going to the two-star restaurant, ever. I'm not giving them the benefit of my doubt because I don't want to be sick. I'm going to the five-star restaurant. Does that make sense that you can push that out to your students? And last but not least, you don't want to be on the six o'clock news. You don't want to be blow bunny where somebody almost died, all right? So there's lots of bad news gets churned up really fast. And, you know, if somebody loses a toe from a pedicure, you know how many times I get it sent to me? I'm not kidding you. Probably a thousand people send it to me because that bad news is in my industry, all right? So I got all kinds of disgusting pictures. All right, last but not least, I'm just going to do these people really quick because I do, I do want you to hear this. And I want you to pass this on to your students. It's, there are a lot of high-risk clients. You don't know who they are, and they come, and they sit in your chair. They sit at your table. They sit. You, you don't ask them the same questions other people ask them, right? You don't ask them the questions that would define if they're high-risk. Do you ask people if they have an immune system impaired by medication or disease? No, that would be a silly question. Do you ask them if they have an illness undiagnosed? If you have an illness that's undiagnosed, you can't say you have it. Like, I can't tell you I have something if I don't know I have it, right? Um, if they harbor a virus that's not currently active. If tomorrow is the day I'm going to come down with the flu, I don't know it today. I feel fine today. Tomorrow is the day I get sick, right? But I'm still shedding the virus today. Um, if I've had a surgical or medical, medical intervention, those people might tell you, hey, I've had a bone marrow transplant. You have to be really careful with me, whatever. Um, if they've traveled outside of the U.S., that got added when Ebola started cropping up again. Or if you have a high-risk occupation. How would you know those things? You don't ask. So I just want to talk really quickly about um, three people that you should be considering when you do the right thing. I want you to treat every single client that ever comes in to your place of business. And I want your students to treat them as though they might be one of these people. Because these people aren't going to tell you they don't know to tell you or they don't even know that they're sick. And they're at extremely high risk of infection. All right? And bad things can happen. First group of people, diabetics. All right? Anybody in this room know a diabetic, is a diabetic, anything like that? If you do, you know that diabetes is a very, very stealthy disease. No pain at all associated with it, right? So people don't know they have it for a really, really long time. So if someone calls your place of business to get a pedicure and your question is, are you diabetic? Guess what? 82% of diabetics go a full five years before they're diagnosed. So in those five years, they're going to say, nope. Nope. Guess what? They are. They just don't know it. They have an illness that's undiagnosed. And they're at the same risk as the person that tells you, yes, I'm diabetic. So quit asking that question. Treat everyone in terms of infection control as though they might be diabetic, all right? Because that is the safest thing to do because a lot of people don't know that they're diabetic, right? And they can get really badly infected very easily. And treating their infections is very difficult, particularly in their periphery, so in their arms and their legs. It's very difficult. So here's some pictures of diabetic people. Now, interestingly enough, this picture on the left, is that those three toes in the middle are necrotic. Those are dead toes. Like, they could just come right off. When I worked in the ER, I had a patient come in. And what the patient said to me, I said, you know, when you're in the ER, like 18 people say, tell me your story. And I'm always like the last one in the room, like, tell me what happened. What's going on tonight? And this patient said to me, her exact words were, I smell bad. Well, I agree. You do smell really, really bad. <laughs> so let's figure out why you smell bad, because you smell like you have a really bad infection somewhere. And she, we're checking out her whole, whole body, and she takes off what I would call like house shoes, because they're not really shoes, but they're not really slippers or something kind of in between, like my grandmother would have them, call them house shoes. Took them off, and almost the entire bottom of one of her feet was that color, black. Now, she didn't feel it, and she walked in on that foot. You or I, if we had that bad of an infection, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even be able to stand up. We'd be in excruciating pain. But because she had been diabetic and diagnosed for some period of time, she couldn't even feel it, all right? I testified not too long ago in a wrongful death suit against um, a uh, cosm uh, cosmetology school where a gentleman had a pedicure and died about a week later. Um, and... This was the whole crux of this arg of the, of the argument in that case. So treat everyone as though they could potentially um, be a diabetic, particularly when you're doing um, pedicures. The next person I want to talk about, anybody in this room know someone who's had um, breast cancer? Everybody knows somebody, right? And when a woman has surgery for breast cancer, they um, either have a lumpectomy or they have a mastectomy. Lumpectomy, just removing the lump in the breast. Mastectomy, removing the entire breast. And very commonly what we do when a woman has um, that surgery is we remove um, the lymph nodes that run through her um, armpit, basically, right? So we remove all of those um, lymph nodes. And the reason we remove those lymph nodes, they look like a little chain of Christmas lights. And the reason we remove them is 
if we call this the sentinel, sentinel node, if the cancer cells are in this node or have moved down to these other ones, there's a good chance it's moved throughout your body. So if you've ever talked to someone who's had breast cancer, the doctor calls them back and says, your nodes are all clean, good to go. It was probably just in your breast. If it's moved into these other lymph nodes, good chance it's spread throughout your body. Because if you remember when you teach about the lymph system, those are the trash haulers of the body, right? It goes all around, it picks up all the byproduct of waste, takes it to the core of your body to be um, excreted, right? Now, in a woman who's had a mastectomy or a lumpectomy, when I would discharge her from the hospital, this is what I would say to her. Never let anybody put a needle in this arm. That means no immunizations and no blood draws out of, let's say it was her right breast, out of this arm. Never let anybody put a blood pressure cuff on this arm. Never stick this hand in an oven. Never garden without a glove on this hand. Never carry your purse on this arm. What am I telling her? Protect this arm, right? I should have been saying, don't go to the cheapy, cheapy nail salon that doesn't do things maybe the way they should because you are at risk of a condition that's a permanent condition called lymphedema. Lymphedema is uncontrolled swelling. You can see this picture is lovely. This woman, it's a sad picture, but that she let them take it. You can see she's had a mastectomy on the right side and look at the difference between her right arm and her left arm. If I take out all your lymph nodes and then you get an infection in this hand or this arm for any reason, you injure it, that byproduct, that swelling, it does what's called third spacing and we can never get it out. It's permanently in your tissue. I one time um, talked to a school and they had a client that came to their floor. It hadn't happened there. She had lymphedema on her right arm, weighed 60 pounds. She was on disability. She can't buy clothes off the rack. She has back problems from her arm weighing so much. She couldn't close her hand to right because she has that bad of lymphedema. You don't want to do that to someone. So everyone who comes in for a nail service should be treated as though they might have had a mastectomy or a lumpectomy because women aren't trained to come and tell you that, right? You don't know who that person is. It's why it is paramount for you to be safe with them. And then last but not least, and this is my last slide, I know you're going to be sad about that, um, is other high-risk people, people that take medications that they don't understand impair their immune system. Anybody in this room have a kid with asthma? Yep, back there. Is your um, two of you back-to-back -back, both have kids with asthma? School-age children? Yep. Okay, what's your, what's your son's name? Uh, Asher. Asher. So you take a daily medication? Okay. So he daily takes it. It's not just rescue inhaler. Okay. So her son, Asher, how old is he? Eleven. Eleven. So her son, Asher, I'm going to pick him just because that helps my story, um, has asthma. I don't have asthma. So if Asher and I are standing next to each other and we breathe in the same air and it irritates our respiratory tract. For me, my immune system sends a little guy with a gun and I cough. <coughs> and I'm done, right? But for Asher, his immune system goes crazy, and it sends the Army and the Air Force and the Marines and nuclear bombs, and he has an asthma attack, and he could die. So we put him on a medication that says to his body, cut it out. Quit that immune response. It takes his immune system, and it goes like this, right? Now, was, does Asher at school, is he, does he get everything that comes through? He always gets every cold. He's, he's everything. She's, yeah, always gets every cold, everything that comes through. Why? Because we just told his immune system to cut it out. It's not specific to his asthma. We are taking his whole immune system and taking it down about three quarters of a notch, right? Because it's not specific to that. It makes him more at risk of getting colds and viruses that come through the school. But it's better to take that chance than to take the chance of having an asthma attack. Those people will all sit in your chair. Those people also include people with rheumatoid arthritis, with plaque psoriasis, anything we take for inflammation increase, re reduces our immune system. When you go home tonight, you have the TV on and they're advertising some medication, it will say, before you start taking this medication, tell your doctor if you live in an area where fungal infections are common. You should not start taking this medication if you have an infection. This medication will make you more prone to infection. And those people will sit in your chair every day and not tell you, hey, I could get injured by this. So I'm going to end it with the last little story, and that is that I got called by a barber board about five years ago now, four years ago. They wanted me to testify in a wrongful death suit against a barber. And what had happened is a gentleman had gotten cut on the ear, gone into the hospital, and died. Older gentleman, and had died. And the, um, the health department determined that the cause of the infection, the source, was this cut. So they go out and they talk to the barber. They send me all the records. And they show me the interview with the barber. And the barber says, I've never disinfected, I've never cleaned, is what he said, I've never cleaned those clippers and no one's ever gotten sick. Oh. Well, guess what? Someone just did. 
And the only thing in his medical record that made him more prone to an infection that could be more aggressive in him than in me, for example, is he had been on medications for rheumatoid arthritis for about 10 years, right? So you don't know who those people are. It is worth treating everyone as though they might be one of these people so that you can protect those people as they sit in your chairs. My last slide is my contact information. You can send me um, questions. You can ask me whatever you need to ask me. Up here, you will find their certificates that each of you can take. If you want me to send you one with your name printed on it, send me an email. And I will need an address. 90% of these I get, please send me a certificate. I have to send you back and say, where do you want me to send it? Um, my business card is here. Feel free to take this as information for how you can do barbicide certification in your classroom. It's free of charge. They can go out to the computer. It's a, it's a thing on our site where they can do it. They complete it. It takes about 40 minutes. They can either send you the letter that they've completed it or print it off and bring it to you. And you can send us a list of all your students and we'll send you all this stuff to give to them, all the blingity bling they like, certificates with their name on it, to put in their portfolios, um, lapel pins and stuff. So it'll tell you how to do that. When you do that, there's an option on there if you're setting up your school to say you want an on-site visit. If you put your name on there, I get an email that says, hey, add this to your on-site visit list. So if I'm here, which I just told you I'm in California all the time, um, there's a good chance I might be able to come out into a class in your school. And that, my friends, is it. If you have questions, I think you have to have a microphone. Yep. What's the length of time of a caller? When you do a, when you're going to provide a service caller, mm -hmm. what's the length of time if you can find the expiration date on that specific product? Okay, so the question he has is well, how do you find the expiration date on things like a color or those other chemicals? It really is up to that manufacturer how they designate it. I mean, I just showed you on bleach. It's not very easy to understand. And it doesn't say best if used by or expires on. So you really have to know that manufacturer. And I, so that mean we should call them and find out because it doesn't come in the box? You should call them and say, what's the shelf life? How long is this good for if it's not in the box? I will tell you, if there's not a shelf life on it, most of the time that means there isn't one. Um, for example, Barbicide, there's no shelf life. So ours doesn't have anything on it because there is no shelf life. It'll last forever. So in your personal opinion, two, three years, four years? I, I wouldn't know. It would depend on the item. Yeah, I'd have no way of knowing. depends on the chemical. Okay. Yep. Some chemicals just are stable enough they can sit forever and some not so much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Question? The tab itself? Yes. Okay. okay, so her question, just for everybody who can't hear, is that um, what about tab liners? So she makes her, her students throw the liner away and then scrub the inside of the bowl with soap and water and a towel. And in the state of California, that's okay, as long as you're putting a new, a new liner in every time. So paper towel is fine. Mm -hmm. Yep, as long as you're using a clean liner. Tell them if they go to work somewhere where they're rinsing out the liners and reusing them, they need to not work there <laughs> or buy their own. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry that I went a little bit over. Only 22 minutes, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Leslie, uh, for coming and, and giving us that great demonstration. We're going to be uh, about a 15-minute break here. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll leave the information. I'll put a new slide up that has her information on it for those of you who are watching by the telecast. Uh, but we'll be back in 15 minutes.